Good morning and welcome to Los Angeles City Council. Today is Friday, March 31st, 2006. And I want to welcome uh, everybody who is here today to John Ferraro Council Chambers here in the third floor of City Hall, room 340. Uh, the Los Angeles City Council meets three days a week um, on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 a.m. And we welcome uh, all members of the public here just to observe or to participate in general public comment or on items that have been noticed for public comment. We're being broadcast live on Channel 35, LA City View, um, which is also rebroadcast in the evening. Uh, we are available online at www.lacity.org, and these council meetings are webcast there. Uh, and that homepage is a great place where there's a wealth of information on the city council and the elected officials of the city of Los Angeles and the departments um, that make up the city. Uh, we also uh, allow public testimony to be given from our Van Nuys City Hall via remote facilities, so folks who ever want to come down at the same hour at Van Nuys City Hall, we have the capability of hearing your testimony for general public comment, and we invite you to take advantage of that too. And then lastly, we are also uh, broadcast on council phone, 213-621-CITY, uh, in which you can listen to the proceedings of the city council and our committees um, as well. As is customary on Fridays, we have uh, presentations to honor special guests, uh, heroes from the community, and prominent city employees. Um, and I'd like to begin those presentations. Today we have uh, quite a few. I want to remind our colleagues that we're uh, keeping those to six minutes. And uh, we will begin with um, Mr. Bill Rosendahl, the great council member from CD11. social workers. Come on over. Come on over behind me. I'm only as good as the crew. Where's Joni? <laughs> now you all get up close. We all, we all can be in the camera, okay? Get on all sides of me. All right, let me get right here first. Uh, good morning, Mr. President, members of the City Council, and citizens of the great city of Los Angeles on Channel 35. It's National Social Worker Month, the month of March. Today is the last day of National Social Workers, and we thought we would come before you. Many of you do know I'm a social worker. I have my MSW from the University of Pittsburgh. And when I was in the Army, I was a psychiatric social worker and saw eight or nine Vietnam vets a day and ran a couple of groups. And in that capacity helped motivate me to run for the city council because some of the homeless in our great city happened to be veterans. In fact, about 18,000 of the homeless in the county are veterans, and it's intolerable. Well, the social workers are the glue. They are the glue for social change. They are the glue that goes out to community and works with groups. As Dennis Zine was with us at our little reception this morning, and he, having been a police officer for 37 years, clearly pointed out that the social workers are the backbone of making things better in society. And I want to say a few words about this. Welcome representatives from the National Association of Social Workers. Um, we social workers feed the hungry, counsel abused children, battered women, and grieving families. We organize community events. We provide social services. We raise awareness of social struggles. We assess human needs. We teach life skills. We're advocates for those who need a voice. I'd like to introduce Joni Diamond, who's the representative of the leadership of the social workers, to say a few words. And Joni, we have this for Social Worker Month for everybody um, to notice. I'm not going to read the whereases, uh, but Joni will talk about social workers. You're up, Joni. Thank you. And happy so birthday. <laughs> it's her birthday tomorrow. <laughs> thank you. It's an honor to be here, and I want to thank the city council members. And on behalf of the National Association of Social Workers, it's a pleasure to receive this during Social Work Month. Social workers are a bachelor degrees, master's degree in social work or doctorate and or doctorate. Uh, to become a licensed clinical social worker, it's two years postgraduate, two years internship hours, followed by a written examination. As Bill Rosendahl uh, shared, we're out in the community. We do advocacy, we're in schools, hospitals, uh, doing consultant services in the courtroom, uh, doing research, we work with disaster mental health, we work with people of all ages, 
from infants to the elderly, and we advocate for people. So it's a pleasure to be here. We also are in private practice. We can do diagnose, assessment, diagnoses, and uh, treatment. We do individual family, marital, couple psycho, psychotherapy. And we're all over in the community, as well as designing, developing programs, administration, and making a difference out in the community. So you each have a packet from National Association of Social Workers at your desk from us, and also our wristband, which says, Stand Up for Others. National Association of Social Workers is the largest uh, national professional organization for social workers. We have 155,000 of us nationwide, approximately 12,000 of us statewide, and almost 4,000 of us within LA County. So it's our pleasure on behalf of the National Association of Social Workers to represent to present to Bill Rosendahl certificate of appreciation and commemoration of his success as a social worker and becoming a Los Angeles City Council member. And thank you so much for this honor today. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Mr. One, one final be comment. Be before you speak, Mr. Rosendahl, Mr. Oh. Reyes would like to add his comments. Oh, yes. Thank you, Council President. I just wanted to rise and acknowledge the National Association of Social Workers and my colleague, Mr. Rosendahl, for one, in this environment today, in this political environment today, when we have a federal government that's willing to spend billions of dollars in another country for a war that people are questioning, billions. And I believe the last time I heard was 69 billion by September, when we have our veterans, the very same individuals who fight in these wars, who end up without support, without care. You become that net. And for that, I thank you, because these are the warriors that have given their lives, have risked their lives, and don't come back complete because of their experiences. And this government chooses to ignore them. And I'm glad you're there, because you're one of the voices that says, this person is ailing, is hurting, and we need to take care of them and you're actually doing it. You're actually there in the trenches. So thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman Rosendahl, for doing this. And I would hope we can amplify this throughout the country so that folks understand our misplaced priorities in this state with our own federal dollars. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you so much. And we have cake in the back room there in celebration for all of you as well. And I might say there's also cake in the back room for Tony Cardenas, whose birthday it is today. Happy birthday, Tony. Yeah. And my last comment is on Prop 63, which um, is an initiative we the people voted for, which puts a lot of money aside, some five to seven hundred million dollars for mental illness. The social workers are going to be the main group that will interface with the homeless and with other uh, mentally ill people and seeing that the money is properly spent. So the challenge is before us. And again, congratulations, everybody. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Rosendahl. Following in the proud tradition of uh, another social worker, Laura Chick, who is a council member, too. Um, all right, our next presentation. Uh, actually, we've got 10 members. Why don't we call the roll? Cardenas, Gruel, Hahn, Wiesar, Labange, Padilla, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, Weiss, Wesson, and Zion, Garcetti. 10 members present in the quorum, Mr. President. Okay, we won't run through the agenda just yet. Um, just to make sure that everybody knows. So let's return to presentations and like to recognize uh, next CD10 and Great council member from that district, Mr. Herb Wesson. Uh, good morning, Mr. President, members. Well, that, oh, I was getting ready to make a request that uh, my colleague Wendy Gruel step up, but she was already one step ahead of me. You know, it's a great honor for me to uh, recognize an individual that has done so much for not just the California or the Los Angeles community, but the national and international uh, community. This is Dr. Gene Grigsby III, who is a distinguished professor in the field of public uh, policy. And he comes from a school that maybe a few of us in this room may have heard of, 
uh, I believe it is called UCLA, and he spent over 35 years of his life there teaching young students, shaping young minds. But on a personal note, I met this man in 1987 when I was chief deputy to then councilman Nate Holden. So I have had the pleasure to know him and to work with him for almost 30 years. In fact, when I met him, his hair wasn't gray and my mustache wasn't gray. And maybe we were about six pounds lighter. But he's worked on projects that have, have had a positive effect throughout the city, throughout the county, and I think the least that we can do is to recognize this individual for the sacrifice of 35 years, albeit a labor of love, an individual who's not going to just go home and watch television and watch Oprah every day. He's involved in a, a, a health care foundation to try to make sure that those who need health care will be able to receive, receive it. It is with great pride that uh, today I'm going to recognize Dr. Eugene Grigsby. Could we please give him a round of applause? At this time, I'm going to ask Wendy Gruel to say a few words, and then we will make a presentation to my dear friend, Jean Grigsby. Thank you, uh, Herb. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to stand here as well, and um, there are, are, are many uh, accolades we could give uh, Jean Grigsby, uh, but uh, for me, it's a personal uh, one uh, in which uh, I also followed his many accomplishments at UCLA and his activism on public policy issues and health care and, and homeless, all the kinds of issues that were important. Uh, but I remember a day, uh, I think it was in uh, 19... 94 or 95, I believe it was, uh, when um, I had been given a, a young woman's name who wanted to intern for me um, by the name of Jenna Grigsby. And I thought, that name sounds really familiar to me. Um, and uh, then I, you know, then she walked in the room and I said, she's Jean Grigsby's daughter. Um, and uh, that was when she was 19 years old. Uh, and uh, that was a few years ago, so I won't tell how old you are. Jenna. Uh, but <clears throat> Gene and his wife's uh, accomplishments are, are many, uh, but one is uh, instilling in their daughter the importance of public service, the importance of getting involved. And so I wanted to, to stand here today with Herb to congratulate Gene with, for all of his uh, accomplishments um, and the, the friendship uh, that we have, have had, the discussions we've had about how to make sure this city goes in, this, in the right direction in this, in this country. Uh, and he has been a, a stalwart individual at UCLA and someone that I'm proud to say is a, a friend and made a difference here in the city of Los Angeles. Congratulations, Gene. Wendy, we're going to put Doc, we're going to put you in the middle. We're going to angle a little bit this way for a photo opportunity. Okay, we're going to ask Mr. Grigsby to say a few words. Uh, just before that, Mr. Padilla wanted to add his good wishes as well. Mr. Padilla? Thank you, Mr. President. Just briefly, not sure if he remembers me, but uh, uh, there was a great dinner conversation, not quite a debate, uh, that I had with Dr. Grisby uh, in front of a good-sized crowd back when the city was grappling with the question of secession uh, and whether or not uh, the city breaking up into multiple municipalities was good uh, for the region or not, and specifically what it meant for the African-American community. So uh, it was a privilege to share the stage with you that night, and uh, congratulations. And Mr. Reyes. I just needed to stand and recognize Mr. Grigsby, Professor Grigsby, from what I recall, uh, as a student in planning school and watching him actually influence many of the young minds at UCLA and essentially address some of the inequities in a very academic way that essentially allowed us to analyze problems, come up with solutions in a pragmatic fashion. But he was always there, Mr. Grigsby, the activist as well, because we talked about those issues that 
people felt uncomfortable speaking to when it came to the tale of two cities. So I want to thank you for your influence, not only on behalf of the city, but for all the generations to come that were able to learn from your experience and your advocacy. Going back to the 80s, I won't start dating ourselves, but uh, you know there were some tough times back in the 80s, and now we are 2006, and it's kind of interesting to see how much we still have to struggle. But thank you for your advocacy, and hopefully we keep you around for more work and change. Thank you so much. Please, Professor. Quick and brief, 35 years has gone by very, very fast. I've enjoyed all of them, and for me, sort of the, the crowning event is to have a former student sitting among you as a distinguished leader and policymaker in the city. I see many of you that I have worked with over a number of different occasions, fighting a number of different battles, but I think as Wendy Gruel said, we've tried to address issues of affordable housing, economic development, poverty, and where we're going to go as a city in bringing everybody along in that process. So all I can say is thank you for allowing me the opportunity of working with you and thank my family for supporting me throughout this time period. Thank you very much and congratulations um, for our next presentation. I will uh, recognize uh, Ms. Gruel again for a second presentation to be followed by uh, Mr. Zine. Thank you, um, Mr. President. It is my uh, pleasure to uh, acknowledge uh, an individual as well uh, as uh, I think his, his, his child, I'll call it a child, uh, Studio City Lifestyle uh, Magazine. Uh, Studio City Lifestyle Magazine was uh, created and founded in 1995. Um, Barry Weiss, uh, who uh, is the individual who made all of this happen, uh, published his uh, first um, issue featuring the CBS Studio Center um, in March of 1996. Uh, today they are celebrating their 10th anniversary. Um, by establishing the Studio City Lifestyle magazine, Barry created a vehicle that brought together people in Studio City, including businesses, um, uh, residents, uh, local uh, government, and various community organizations. And he really created an, an opportunity for allowing our Studio City Farmers Market. He is a board member of the Chamber of Commerce and the Studio City Improvement Association. He has received uh, the Fran Quigley Award reflecting his dedication and commitment to a Studio City community and the Small Business of the Year Award from the United Chambers of Commerce. Uh, he also was very active in the formation of the Studio City Neighborhood Council and is currently a member of the Outreach uh, Committee. Studio City Lifestyle Magazine has provided a decade of responsible journalism while also at, um, offering uh, advertisement opportunities, articles profiling people, celebrities, and events in Studio City. Um, he has been nice enough to allow me to have a column every month uh, in the Studio City Lifestyle Magazine. But anywhere you go in Studio City, whether it be a restaurant, a business, the library, uh, you name it, there you see that incredible, beautiful cover always with some unique picture of an individual, uh, an event where we were celebrating the um, kind of the all the people in Studio City who were supportive of post 9-11 activities and, and supporting individuals who were affected by that. Um, and it's something we look forward to every month. Uh, but Barry is not just a business owner. He is an individual who has committed his life to, to Studio City and is someone who I value um, as a partner and as a friend in Studio City. And so it is really uh, my pleasure. We have the entire city council um, and the mayor uh, signing this and the controller and city attorney acknowledging uh, Barry Weiss and Studio City Lifestyle Magazine uh, for their 10 year anniversary. If I could ask everyone to give her a great big round of applause. 
And I know Barry has his mom and sister with him today, uh, and we're so pleased to have them, and you'd be very proud um, of your son and brother, who's really made a difference. Um, and I'd like to uh, present this to Barry Weiss and then ask him to say a few words. Thank you, Wendy. You don't stand close at all. Gotcha. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here, and it's so been a wonderful experience establishing this publication in what I consider the greatest town on this planet. And it's a pleasure to be a part of the city of Los Angeles, which I feel is a world-class city. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, and Thank congratulations. You. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. All right, our next presentation is Mr. Zine, who I believe has two presentations. We'll be followed by Mr. Padilla. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning. I have. Um, I have a magic envelope here. I see my time is kick clicking. I want to make sure you're here too. Okay. Uh, judge John H. Sandoz, the Honorable Judge of the uh, Superior Court. Judge Sandoz moved to Los Angeles with his family at the age of three. Married to Beverly, they have two children, Eric and Nicole began legal experience in August 1970 as a regional Herbert Smith community lawyer fellow assigned to the Western Center of Law and Poverty to the Watts Office of the Los Angeles Neighborhood Legal Services Society. Said entity is now a part of the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. In January 1971, Judge Santos was admitted to the California Bar, carried a full client caseload, and was active in numerous community projects. These include membership on the Board of Directors of Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, member of the Legion Lex, National Bar Association, Los Angeles County Bar Association, Family Law Section Executive Committee, National Conference of Black Lawyers, Langston Bar Association, and California Association of Black Lawyers. Was also on the Board of Directors, Legion Lex, General Counsel, National Association of Black Social Workers. We just honored social workers, and you were a social worker too. Los Angeles Chapter, General Counsel, Project Help, Board of Directors, Teen Post Incorporated, Advisory Council, Teen Post Youth Information Center, General Counsel, Broadway Federal Savings and Loan Association, Policy Planning Committee, South Central Los Angeles Regional Center for Dependently Disabled, Board of Directors, Central City Community Mental Health Facility. This is just the past history. After completing one year fellowship, went into private practice in South Los Angeles, specialized in civil law and litigation. October 1971, formed a law partnership with Herbert T. Hudson, was the managing partner. February 1st, 1977, the partnership was expanded to include Irma J. Brown, was the managing partner of said law firm until his appointment to the Superior Court Commissioner in August 1981. Assignment to the Superior Court Commissioner included family law, law in motion, district attorney, child support. October 1995, appointed to judge of Los Angeles Superior Court, continues in that position where he is presently assigned to family law. January 2003, appointed to assistant supervising judge of the family law department of the Los Angeles Superior Court. Judge Santos and his wife Beverly presently reside in Pasadena, California. And I met the judge on a, a county judicial commission where we uh, worked with other members to try and make sure that everything was nice and smooth in the criminal justice system for the people of the county. And I told the judge when I heard he was going to retire that we need to bring him to City Hall and to acknowledge and honor him and that he would always have a, a special place in the hearts of the people of Los Angeles with all he's done to help people in our wonderful county and city. So on behalf of the people of Los Angeles, Judge and Beverly, I have a resolution honoring you, commending you for your wonderful service to the people of this county. Uh, and it's interesting that the judge loves cookies. <laughs> the judge loves cooking. He's got, he's got this real sweet tooth, and uh, we always tease each other about that. So uh, I hate to see you go, but I, I know Beverly and your family looking forward to spending more time with you. But on behalf of all the folks, Judge, uh, congratulations and happy retirement as you leave the bench, and uh, many, many years of health and happiness to you and your wonderful family. 
and I will uh, now turn the microphone over to you. And the, the court is in session for Judge Sandoz. <clears throat> Thank you. It is indeed a great pleasure to be here. This isn't the first occasion I've been before the City Council, but as a practicing lawyer, I was able to come here on many occasions and work with many community groups. Unfortunately, as a judicial officer, uh, there is a difficulty in appearing in political arenas, and so I have not been here for the last 25 years. <laughs> but uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm sorry that Dennis had to talk about my cookies, but that's the way it is. Dennis is a great friend and a great person to work with, and I've worked with him for the last two or three years on the commission, and it's been very fruitful. And thank you for this honor. Thank you, Judge. We're going to take some pictures. We're going to do some pictures in the back. And then that pictures in the back. Thank you. I have uh, one more presentation. If I can please have the uh, law enforcement folks come forward. We're very honored and proud to have with us representatives of law enforcement. Law enforcement is international, and what we have is with us the uh, members of the French National Police, Patrick Hammond, Chief Commander, Counselor of the General Director of the French National Police. He's the Director of the French National Police Communications Department. Chief Hammond has been with the French National Police since 1978. The French National Police will be participating in a cultural exchange with Los Angeles law enforcement agencies in January 2007. Chief Hammond is here to set up logistical needs of such a visit and to meet with various law enforcement agencies which will be participating in the event which will coincide with the 2007 Golden Globe ceremonies. Local law enforcement agencies will have an opportunity to demonstrate their ability to operate as one unit during a time of extreme crisis. In France, the country has only one type of police, the national police. There are no city, county, or state. It's all under the national police. We are delighted to have you here today and hope that your stay in Los Angeles is a memorable experience. I've met with the chief and other representatives from the French National Police and their escort is Leland Tang, a representative, a member of the California Higher Patrol. So, uh, where you are, chief? Congratulations, welcome to Los Angeles. And uh, we're very proud to have you here to host you in our wonderful city. And uh, speaking on behalf of the French National Police. Sure, go ahead. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, really a pleasure and an honor for us to be in front of the City Council of Los Angeles today. Um, as Mr. Zain said, if we are here this week, is to present um, a project of cooperation between the French National Police and the Californian uh, law enforcement. So in this framework, uh, we met this, uh, this week uh, all the chiefs of the LAPD, the LASP, SD, sorry, the Californian Highway Patrol and the chief of Be Beverly Hills Police. Uh, the project is to come in January 2007 with 30 French motorcycles, police officer, and during one week to share experiences to uh, see how we work, if we could work together, and to, uh, to share a lot of things, uh, trainings, weather working, of, uh, whatever. So we were very well welcomed by all the chief, and uh, the meeting we had this week were very uh, helpful, very useful, and we know now we, uh, we will be able to, uh, to realize this project. So it will be really a pleasure for us to come back uh, next January to, uh, to work with you as, a, as we do uh, every day here in the US and, and in France too. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, and again, welcome very much. We look forward to seeing you back here. Um, our next presentation is Mr. Padilla. And Mr. Padilla will be followed by Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Mr. President, colleagues. Good morning. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, make a couple of announcements this morning. A lot of you had a chance to meet uh, individually and personally a very special guest with us today, uh, Ado President Adolfo Carrion uh, of, from the Bronx in New York. Uh, he and Carol Alvarado, Mayor Pro Tem of Houston, uh, have been here for the last couple of days as part of the Nano Educational Fund, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials. New York, Houston, and Los Angeles, respectfully, are part of a three-pronged community organizing uh, project and initiative 
sponsored by Naleo, and a corporate sponsorship being provided by Advance America. And they're represented by uh, friends of ours, Natasha Fuman and Deborah Reyes, who are here with us. Uh, looking at three uh, particular areas and engaging people in uh, the American civic process, uh, particularly the Latino community. First of all, naturalization and citizenship. What are the obstacles and how can we overcome them? Second, voter registration and participation. And third, financial literacy. Uh, and just to give you uh, an insight as to some of the uh, statistics that we're finding in the arena of citizenship, four out of 10, or specifically 41% of Latino adults living in the United States are not US citizens. Why? Why not? How can we get them to become citizens? That's what we're working on. 4.2 million legal uh, residents, Latinos, are eligible to become US citizens, but have not. In the arena of voter participation, there are 16 million Latino US adult citizens, yet only 9 million are registered to vote. How can we register more of them? How can we get them to participate? And on the financial security side, a full one-third of Latinos living in the United States do not have either a checking account or a savings account. For immigrant Latinos, the statistic is more than 40%. So we obviously have some work to do, and we've spent a couple of days uh, with leaders in Houston and, and New York, here in Los Angeles, talking about how are you addressing it in your city? Here's what we're doing in ours, trying to share those experiences, share those successes, uh, and those lessons learned to improve our outreach efforts uh, across the country. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, now for some brief comments, uh, President Adolfo Carrion. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Council Member, Mr. President, and members of the City Council of the City of Angels. I am delighted to be here, and on behalf of the 1,400,000 people that I represent in a small town called the Bronx in New York, uh, I, want, I, I bring you greetings. And I also bring you greetings wearing the hat of Vice President of the National Association of Latino Elected Officials. We have 1,000 members. Uh, we have about in excess of 5,000 Latino elected officials across the country. And we are having a very important conversation about the future of our community and the future of the American enterprise, American cities, uh, and the leadership in our country. Uh, and how Latinos get engaged uh, more uh, substantial, uh, substantially and significantly in, in the American enterprise. And so uh, we were delighted to spend a little time, too little time, in Los Angeles. We'll have to come back. But we will be hosting a conversation in New York City and the Bronx and bringing folks from here over there. Um, I, uh, I really enjoyed the time here and I want to say to uh, Council Member Padilla and to the President of the Council and to all the folks that made us feel so welcome, thank you for your hospitality and we look forward uh, to continued collaboration in building stronger cities here and everywhere across the American continent. And thank you. We have a Another council member would like to, to speak as well, and I hope that you're not getting any twitches seeing all those Dodger jerseys right next to you being, you know, coming from the Yankees, uh, Yankees hometown, but we can uh, respectfully agree to that's one of the best rivalries in baseball anywhere, and we really are very proud to have you here, um, proud to have somebody of your stature and your accomplishments as well grace us in the council chamber, so thank you, Mr. President, for being here, and I know Mr. Reyes would like to say a few words as well. Mr. Reyes? As a district that houses and, and supports the Dodgers, it's great to have the Yankees uh, representative district here. But I just wanted to also just stand and, and acknowledge Naleo and all of you for being that voice that connects the different cultures. We have a vast and very valuable immigrant experience in this country. This country is built on the immigrant experience. And to have individuals like yourselves who look and speak and, and, and know the, the, the culture, the food, the song of a great number of our constituents in this country, represented as mayors, as council members, as a, a ward, borough representatives, and to actually have the ability to look at how you create a registration drives, how you connect people who don't typically vote, to make them aware of the significance of their vote. I see Naleo doing a great amount of work in that area, and it's the bridge building 
that you create that's going to make a change in the future. So on behalf of all the young folks who are looking towards role models like yourselves, thank you for being there on their behalf. So congratulations. Mr. Mr. Wesson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. I, too, rise to uh, welcome you to uh, the great City of the Angels and to commend you for the work you're doing, organizing people, trying to, to, to put in place things that help all people. Now, the one thing that I would like to do is to invite you back. But when you come back, I want you to come back towards the summer because I am of the belief that their visit brought the rain. And we really did not want the New York rain in Los Angeles. But again, on a serious note, I want to commend our, our uh, President Emeritus for recognizing you today and to thank you for all of the work. It's important that we as people connect with each other and focus on the things that we have in common and not the things that make us different. Thank you so much and have a safe uh, flight home. And, uh, just to conclude a couple of things, I want to present, uh, where is Marcelo here? Marcelo Geiter, the staff of Naleo, a certificate on behalf of the city of Los Angeles, just commending you. I know the project is not over. Uh, we're looking forward to final results, but uh, commending you on this tremendous work. Uh, and of course, in the spirit of hospitality and in uh, and, and, and being very collegial uh, to our friend from the Bronx, uh, Adolfo Carrion, Mr. President, thank you for your work and your visit to Los Angeles. We hope to see you in the playoffs. And, uh, <laughs> I know Tom Labonte isn't with us this afternoon or this morning, but uh, a story he can appreciate. Just yesterday, uh, the president had to duck out of our meeting to use my office to get on the phone because they're uh, still under final negotiations for the new Yankee Stadium. Yes. Uh, and something Mr. Reyes can appreciate. It should include a rail stop for the subway system. So uh, we can say it happened in, this, in my office. Uh, so thank you very much. And just in conclusion, uh, timing couldn't be better. We saw what took place on the streets of Los Angeles, in downtown Los Angeles, just this last weekend. 500,000 people demonstrating in the issue of citizenship and uh, immigration reform. Imagine if it was not just 500,000 people, but if it was 500,000 citizens and 500,000 registered voters, how powerful that would be. That's the vision. That's what we're working towards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bedia. I'd like to now uh, acknowledge uh, Mr. Reyes for an introduction. Thank you, Council President. It's with great honor I stand before you to introduce Michael Lee. Mr. Lee is completing 33 years of dedicated and loyal service to the city of Los Angeles. He is a member of the award-winning, nationally recognized City Department of Building and Safety. So let's give him a round of applause for all his years. He's here with his dear wife, and we're here to recognize him for his hard work and making a difference in our city. The leadership of Mr. Andrew Adelman and his great staff, we've been able to make incredible changes in areas of greatest need in our city. But it's important we recognize individuals that make such a difference. Mr. Lee has demonstrated his genuine concern for the welfare of others as exemplified by his service with the United Way campaign, combined health fund campaign, which he has received numerous commendations. Mr. Lee has repeatedly demonstrated an outstanding ability to complete large workloads, taking additional responsibilities quickly and successfully, adapt to new and difficult situations, effectively responded to unforeseen crises, 
and held controversial projects, all of which have earned him numerous public, departmental, and city commendations, making him a true and vital asset to the operations of the city of LA. I have several whereases. Uh, we have a great certificate with his name, and I want to thank you for signing this certificate. But it's also important to understand that Mr. Lee's embodiment, his dedication to the city, also has an influence in his private life. My understanding is this is where he met his wife. Is that correct? correct. That's correct. Fantastic. So without further ado, I'd like to present this resolution on behalf of the city council signed by our city attorney, Rocky Delgadillo, our city controller, Laura Chick, and our city clerk, Mr. Lee, for your great service, for everything you've done for our city. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I'd like to share a few words. Before you do, let me ask Mr. Adelman if you'd like to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, council members, thank you for honoring uh, Mr. Mike Lee. He has been a dedicated employee of the department. I am here to congratulate Mike and Susan Lee on uh, his graduation and 33 year of service. But I'm sad for the Department of Building and Safety because we are, and the city family, because we are losing one of our great assets. About five years ago, we had some challenges in code enforcement in South LA. And I chose our A-plus team to go down and take care of that. That was Ruben Perez and Mike Lee. And within six months, they took care of that. Among the other things that Mike Lee has managed is contract nuisance abatement, that is demolition of the nuisance and abandoned buildings, and also something which has been very successful, the PACE program, proactive code enforcement program. Thank you, Mike, for a job well done. We'll miss you, man. I'd like to th uh, thank the city council for this, uh, this honor. It's truly overwhelming. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work for, I think, probably the greatest department in, in this, this city. Uh, the management's super, and, and I'm really going to miss everybody here, and I'm going to miss the work. I truly enjoyed every uh, day of my 33 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Garcetti for our next presentation. Well, it's time to bring that Dodger blue up here. So I'd like to welcome all of our young friends from the Echo Park neighborhood and the Central City Action Committee and the Dodger Dream Foundation to join us up here as well. Um, Central City uh, Action Committee, which is one of those jewels here in Los Angeles that is able to um, beautify a neighborhood, train young people in the value of, of hard work, um, be able to link the community um, to one another, has been uh, doing a number of programs in Echo Park, which Mr. Reyes and I have the joy of representing, which is my own neighborhood where I live as well. And the Dodger Dream Foundation, uh, we approached a while ago for a donation. Um, and they have donated $10,000 to supplement the Sunset Boulevard Beautification Team, a program uh, that we began in 2005. And Marianne Hayashi, who is here from the Central City Action Committee, um, and uh, uh, the young people who do the work, and Dave Bermudez, her very capable deputy, um, are here to celebrate the beautification and ongoing cleaning of Echo Park. Echo Park is one of those great pedestrian environments that we want to see throughout the city of Los Angeles. And if you go there during the week, and especially on the weekends, you see people walking and shopping, um, taking their groceries from their home without ever getting into a car. But because of that activity in Echo Park Lake as well, there's always a lot of trash that's around too. Um, so CCAC uh, addresses a number of beautification concerns since 1973. Their multi-service programs include tutoring, for young people, counseling, recreational activities, a camping program, which is great. And their ongoing goal is to get neighborhood kids in uh, Echo Park to be a part of uh, the beautification of their own community through tree planting, graffiti abatement, um, community garden maintenance, and lot cleaning. So in July 2005, we started a program that pays a stipend to youth in the community to help clean the decorative garbage cans that were designed by other young people in Echo Park as part of the Targeted Neighborhood Initiative um, begun under Jackie Goldberg and continued um, when I became council member, as well as steam cleaning sidewalks and graffiti removal as well. Uh, CCAC 
along with our council offices, has been an active leader in reaching out, going door to door to talk to all the businesses on Sunset Boulevard. And they probably speak about six or seven languages, those business um, owners, but letting folks know what their responsibilities are regarding sidewalk and parkway cleanliness. The Dodger Dream Foundation, which is just down the street, noticed that Sunset Boulevard around Dodger Stadium was indeed looking more beautiful as a result of this hard work. And as a result, they announced in December that they would award a $10,000 grant to supplement the Sunset Boulevard beautification team in 2006. We thought it only fitting that some of the young people who would be doing that work could proudly display the Dodger blue as well, um, displaying the neighborhood pride and the civic pride that we have as well. So the Dream Foundation, I think many people know of, was created in 1998 uh, to provide educational and athletic and recreational opportunities for all the youth in uh, Los Angeles, really. And the foundation places a spe special emphasis on serving traditionally underserved youth. And we just think it's really wonderful that they're also doing that in their own neighborhood there in Echo Park. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to uh, Councilmember Reyes to say a few words, and we'll present a couple certificates to congratulate these young people, the foundation, and CCAC. Let's give Mr. Garcetti a round of applause. <laughs> Frank and Jamie McCourt get it. They have a great staff in Howard Sunken and Susan Wong. They guide their resources in such a way where they are sharing that which they give back to the community with our young people to demonstrate that pride in their neighborhoods. I want to thank Mr. Garcetti because on his side of the neighborhood we share, we always say we are seamless in our efforts. And this is a great example of that. They're actually taking care of that impression, that sense of self-esteem by doing some very basic work like cleaning up. And so giving that example for our youth, having a big business like Dodger Stadium, and having great staff that demonstrates their goodwill for our city is something to be applauded. So I want to thank them for their hard work, their commitment. They made a tremendous change in their attitude towards community. They put their money where their mouth is, and we can see it in the benefits of CCAC. And just one last thing about CCAC, with Ms. Hayashi and her staff, these are the folks that go out there and paint the graffiti. They face the dangers of the day when you're dealing with gang issues. They take that on. They paint away that graffiti. They make our neighborhoods cleaner. I want to thank them for their endless effort, so congratulations. So Mr. Reyes and I would like to present to Howard Sunken on behalf of the Dodger Dream Foundation the Certificate of Appreciation. Thank you for your generous gift to the Sunset Boulevard Beautification Team in helping make Echo Park a, a better neighborhood. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll hear from Howard in just a second. Also the Central City Action Committee, Marion Hayashi, uh, who just is an incredible asset for our community. Thank you too for your unending commitment to the community. And, and with both of their indulgences, we're going to go from the program just a little bit. Maria, come on forward. We're going to hear from one of the people who actually is from the community um, to say a couple words, and then um, Marianne and, and Howard will back clean up as it is. Go for it. What's it like to work on the program? It feels good working in Central City because we clean and we help. At the center, we do many things as helping us to be in school, having fun and being with our friends and doing the right thing. Right. Thank you. Good job. Uh, thank you so much for having us here today. I'd really like to thank the Dodger Foundation and especially the Dream Foundation for giving us the opportunity to, do, to meet one of our very important goals and objectives of this agency, that, and that's to have the young people be part of the community. So they uh, go out and clean. They not only do that, they take uh, interest in all the activities in the community. They go to forums and fairs, and we participate in uh, tree planting and uh, pass out water at Chinatown 10K Run. We were one of the water, sta all of the water stations. And anything that goes on the community, we try to involve the young people in. And I really want to thank uh, Councilman Eric Garcetti and Councilman Reyes and their staff members who are so supportive of this program. And it's uh, the youth re receive a stipend, but we take this very seriously. Uh, David Bermudez, who runs our graffiti removal project, they start at 6 o'clock in the morning and they end at 2.30. But David is there at 4.30 in the afternoon. He does the training of the young people. They are trained on safety, proper use of tools and equipment, and proper dress. 
and he's even teaching them and me on what's a weed and what's a flower, what you're supposed to pull and what you're not supposed to pull. And also I have two young men here who were products of the program and they are now counselors and program directors. And uh, they take care of the time cards, scheduling and everything else. So it's a regular job training program. But let me tell you about the young people. They do get a stipend. And this is part of, uh, we have 30 youth involved in this program. The young people here today are off track and are able to participate with us. They donate 10 hours of volunteer time to the agency. You know, uh, federal funds are getting, you know, they're getting cut back a little bit or prices go up. We depend on our young people to help us run this agency. They put in 10 hours each a week of volunteer time. They help either uh, uh, one of our staff coach the young Pee Wee basketball team. They, and they're involved, they're going to be part of the Dodger giveaways. Uh, what else do we do? We do cleanups, they do uh, help with clerical work. So they're really involved and I think that this is the thing that we really want to honor young people today and I think it's very appropriate for me personally because I did work and my husband, we worked with, the, with Cesar Chavez in the movement and today is his birthday so I feel personally today it's an honor to be here on his birthday and I think every council person here and every deputy, I think we all have a responsibility. There are so many young people in the community who are always doing really good things. And a lot of times no one knows about it and I think we all have a responsibility to showcase these young people to really realize that they are part of the solution not, and not part of the problem. So thank you again. Thank you, Marianne. And, and I know our time has expired under our own policy, so we're going to have Howard Sunken for all those Channel 35 viewers uh, say some things out back on the camera for Channel 35. But again, congratulations to all uh, the young people and thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Well, we'll, we'll go to back and take pictures together. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Cardenas and Councilmember Padilla for a special presentation. Excuse me, Mr. Rosendahl has pushed his button before uh, we go on to the next. Mr. Rosendahl? Mr. Rosendahl? With the kids, at first I want Howard Sunken to stand in front of the mic so the world could see. I've known Howard for a long time, and what the kids are doing is a real positive step. So I want to thank you, Howard Sunken, for the leadership you're providing on this from the Dodgers. Thank you, Howard. Just before Mr. Padilla and Mr. Cardenas uh, begin your presentation, I'd like to acknowledge the students from You Think, a program of the Zimmer Children's Museum. If I could have them stand, or if they're here, they're coming back in. Wave in the back of the room. We're so pleased uh, that you are here today. Thank you very much uh, for, for being here uh, in our council chambers today. Again, the students from You Think, a program of the Zimmer Children's Museum. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, colleagues, this is a, a tag team presentation. Uh, both uh, Councilmember Cardenas and I are uh, pleased uh, to recognize Lily uh, Esparza for her many, many years of service to the City of Los Angeles. Got to get her up here. She's <laughs> hiding behind me. Uh, having joined the City family in uh, 1969 with the Information Technology Agency, uh, we've come a long way. Yeah, we have. Technology. Uh, has come a long way and over the years uh, she's provided a uh, tremendous amount of professionalism uh, and work to the Information Technology Agency, uh, to the Los Angeles Convention Center and more recently to the Los Angeles City Employees uh, Retirement System. Uh, having been at the Convention Center for example uh, in its heyday working with the architects uh, to have the Convention Center not only look the way it looks today but from an information system standpoint function uh, the way it does uh, in modern times. Uh, at Lacers, uh, where she's worked in, in recent years, amongst the other projects that she's been uh, a part of, is a comprehensive retirement management system. A lot of city employees, uh, a lot of retirement plans, and a lot of, a lot of numbers as well as the electronic document management system uh, in uh, the modern era where we're trying to move away from 
paper, 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 and more towards electronic uh, information uh, gathering, collection, management, uh, et cetera. Uh, it's the folks behind the scenes that leverage technology uh, to not only have us comply with the law, but actually function as a more effective and as a more efficient city. So uh, wanted to, to be part of this presentation uh, and uh, at this point have uh, Councilmember Cardenas say a few words. I just wanted to add my congratulations to Lily Esparza for her wonderful work for 37 years in this city. My God, that's probably more years than some council members have been alive. Uh, <laughs> <It'd> be <nice. laughs> but her dedication and commitment to this city is has been wonderful and tremendous. And we all know what it's like to raise children. Uh, Lily has been very blessed and fortunate to have Alexa, Lisa, and Eric uh, to raise as well. And I'm sure she's done as well with them as she's done in her, her day job. Uh, because I've gotten to know her daughter, Lisa, who works with the American Diabetes Association and has been doing wonderful, tremendous work. And I fall in love with, I have fallen in love with this family for their dedication, not only to the community, but to the, some of the most needy people in our community through organizations like the ADA. And I'm sure it's just a reflection of how Lily's raised her children, how to teach them how to give back, and how to give of themselves above and beyond the call of duty, just like she's done for 37 years for this great city of Los Angeles. So with that, Lily, you want to say a few words? Um, I want to thank the council, um, thank my family for, for the support. Very close. <laughs> Um, I have worked many years for the city. Hopefully I have touched uh, and made an improvement and, and left some label behind. I know uh, when I was at the convention center, I implemented a system and it was my system when there was a problem. And uh, they're always my systems when there are problems. <laughs> and hopefully we are very few and uh, I, I'm just ready to partake in another adventure in my life, and hopefully it'll be a long, and I'll outlive my retirement uh, de uh, contribution. So, <laughs> um, so thank you very much, and I appreciate this. Thank you. We want to, Lily Esparza, we want to thank you and present you with this well-deserved commendation resolution from the City of Los Angeles, signed by all of the members of the City Council, and we could take a vote. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, um, acknowledge Mr. Smith for a brief introduction. And President, uh, I'm pleased to introduce to you today a dedicated county employee He's re who's retiring after 38 years of service to the county, but also the city of Los Angeles. Constance Perrette has served the county of Los Angeles as the uh, county operational area coordinator for emergency preparedness and response and recovery, uh, particularly uh, planning, coordination, and preparedness, and was the, the point person after the Northridge earthquake in 1994 for countywide recovery, which included the city of Los Angeles. And she's leaving us today after 38 years. I want to introduce her to the council and thank her publicly for her service to all the people of Los Angeles County. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Wesson for an introduction for CD4. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Today I've been asked to pinch hit for our colleague, uh, Tom LaBange, who's uh, at home right now taking care of his wife. Uh, in order to have a great city, it takes several components. We've got to have great people, and we have that uh, uh, a downtown that's growing and thriving. We've got to have good sports teams. We, we need to have a good uh, transportation system that we're working on. And also, we need to have a very strong uh, cultural component. And, and we have that in the individuals from LACMA. Uh, Mr. LeBonge had asked me to ask Jack Weiss 
to uh, join me with this too. Anyway, uh, back in 1910, uh, the LACMA was part of a, uh, the, the Natural History Museum. In 1965, it was established uh, on its own and became one of the largest uh, art facilities, art museums within the country. Uh, last year alone, 1.5 million people visited uh, the, the exhibits and the museums, and almost a half million of those people participated in film programs and, and other activities. They have a paid membership of over 85,000, and the uh, museum currently has at least 100,000 items that are on permanent display. But the thing that's so cool or so great about this is we bring in traveling shows and exhibits, and I can remember Tut One, and my wife was a volunteer during Tut One, and I, I met her and quickly married her after that. And then this, just recently we had Tut Two, and this one I actually had an opportunity to go to. It was so successful that you, you, you really couldn't get in. We had to do a 8 a.m. showing on a Saturday or something uh, like that. The museum realizes also that it has to adjust and change uh, with time, so they're doing a major renovation and should be commended uh, for already raising nearly $200 million towards uh, this renovation. And lastly, I will say that in order for anything to be successful, that it takes uh, leadership. And I'm proud today to have the president, uh, and I'm going to try not to butcher the last name, Melanie Kanshak. Great job. And Jean O, oh, who's the Director of External Affairs here. But before we present them with this uh, resolution, I want to ask my neighbor to the north, Councilman Jack Weiss, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Herb. Um, and uh, I'll just say, the, the reason that, that Mr. West and I are doing this is because Mr. LeBonge is not able to be with us today. Um, uh, neither Mr. West nor I, no matter how many years we work in this business, neither of us are ever going to be able to amass the record of support for LACMA that Tom LeBonge has amassed. You have no better friend and booster uh, and admirer in this city than Tom, and uh, I'm sure he's going to do everything he can to be a part of the, uh, the festivities that you have coming up. Um, her, I, I remember Tut One, but I, it was an elementary school field trip for me, and I'm, it wouldn't have been the right time to, to you know, you know, hook up with a wife or anything it just it just wouldn't have been right um but uh, uh congratulations to lacma yeah 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 i get that i get that but still um congratulations to y'all lacma really really proud that you're not just in los angeles but that you're uh that that you're that you're you know you've become such a recognized international leader and so uh, we'd love to hear from you thank you and before we hear from her i'd like to have mr rosendahl would like to say a few words mr rosendahl First, I, I just want to say to Tom and Bridget, who I know are watching this on TV, that we're with you 100%. You are a dynamic duo couple that have made a tremendous difference in our city. To Bridget and Tom LaBonge, who are watching this on TV. Secondly, I want to acknowledge that Nancy Daly Reardon is your chair. And she assumed this responsibility not too long ago. Nancy has been a major uh, student children advocate for foster children. But she has now switched into this, where she is now the chair of your board. Nancy is one of our true leaders in our city, and I congratulate Nancy Daly Reardon, as well as you all, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you all of the council members, uh, particularly Councilman LaBonge's office, who is our dear, dear friend takes good care of us. Councilman Weiss's office, also our neighbor and a, and a caregiver, and of course, Council, Councilman Wesson. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the city departments. We work in collaboration with Department of Planning, Department of Building and Safety, uh, City Fire, 
police departments. Without the city, LACMA could not be who it is. So my thanks very much to the city of Los Angeles. Thank you as well for a chance to celebrate our 40th birthday. Um, my 40th birthday again. Uh, we turned 40 uh, this year at the LA County Museum of Art. We're celebrating it all weekend long. Uh, free admission at the museum today, Saturday, and Sunday. I encourage everyone, especially the, all the youngsters here in the audience, to come down to LACMA over the weekend. Uh, Saturday night is teen night at LACMA. We're open for teens. You can come and hang out. We'll have cool things to do. So come down, visit, and uh, visit all of the cultural institutions in the city. It is what makes the city of Los Angeles so great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh... Thank you very much, Mr. Rea, excuse me, Mr. Weiss and uh, uh, Mr. Wesson this morning. Uh, colleagues, uh, we've now completed our presentations today. Uh, before we begin public comment, um, we'd like to just quickly go through the agenda to call those items special, and then we will move to public con comment. Madam Clerk. Uh, first item is the approval of the minutes. Uh, Mr. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Zine moves, Mr. Weiss seconds. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Mr. Reyes uh, moves and Mr. Padilla seconds. Madam President, before beginning the regular agenda, there is a request to continue item number 13, and that request is for 60 days, and the new date would be June 2nd. Uh, without objection, item number 13 will be con uh, continued to, you said June 2nd. Uh, Next. The, I'm sorry, on the regular agenda, items noticed for public hearing, items one through eight are street lighting um, hearings and council recommendation for council action would be to open the hearing and continue the hearings and ordinances to April 21st. Um, that being the order of the business, do we need to take a vote on that, Madam uh, Clerk? No, Madam President. Okay. Those items will be continued. On the next items on the agenda are items for which public hearings have been held, items 9 through 16. On items 9, 10, and 11, uh, reports have been submitted and distributed to the council members. And on item number 16, there are two reports on the file, and council can adopt both reports if it wishes. Yes. Uh, any specials, colleagues? Any specials? Item 9 through 16. If not, uh, Madam Clerk. I'm sorry, Mr. Parks. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I just would, on uh, item 16, is just ask that we uh, uh, approve the, uh, the budget and finance report, and also there's a mending motion that's going around to uh, alter some of the funding. Has, uh, has that been distributed, or will she hold that yes. item on? It has been distributed. It should, it should be distributed. Seen it, it should probably be called special. For the oh, we would hold it special we'll until hold that on the desk. Okay. Item number 16 will be called special. Madam Clerk, open the roll on the remaining items. Close the roll. Tabulate the votes. 12 ayes. Those items have been approved. Next order. Next items are items for which public hearings have not been held. Items 17 through 38. Ten votes are required for consideration. Any specials, colleagues? Mr. Badia. Uh, item 36 for a uh, technical amendment that's being circulated. So we can go ahead and vote on that since it's been... It hasn't been circulated. It has not, not been yet. circulated. Okay. We'll call that item. Oh. Item number third special. Any other specials, colleagues? Yes. Excuse me, mister. We're not there yet, but we will do 41. Next, uh, Mr. P uh, Parks. Uh, a special 30, and I ask uh, that we continue uh, 35 until next Tuesday. Ms. Hahn? Special. 31? Mm -hmm. Okay. Item 31 would be called special. I think that's item 30 and 31 will be called special, and item 36 and 35 would be continued until Tuesday. Any other specials? If not, uh, Madam Clerk. Open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the votes. 12 ayes. Next item. Uh, next item is on the uh, continuation agenda. That's item number 39, and that is an item notice for public hearing, and I believe there is a card on that item. Yes, there is a card on that item, uh, so we will call that item special. Uh, the next item is uh, item number 40, and that has had a public hearing. Okay. Uh, we do not have a card on that item. Anyone will call item 40 special? Yes. Item 40 special. Item 40 special. Mm -hmm. Mr. Parks. Uh, next items are 
41 and 42, and public hearing has not been held. Uh, Ten votes are required for consideration on those. I know Mr. Rosenau would like to have 41 called special. Mr. 42 called special by Mr. Parks. You missed us, Mr. Parks. That's why you're calling all these special today, aren't you? Okay, next order. Uh, that would take council back to the items called special. Yes, yeah, so before we go to the items called special, we will go to public comment uh, period. I'd like to uh, first uh, introduce N Natalie Reyes and David Luong. Please, go ahead. Um, go ahead. Um, could we have one, one voice, one purpose come up and join us? Good morning, Council President Wendy Gruel and members of the Council. As you have seen in the last week, many students around the Los Angeles area have walked out of their schools, many with motives and few with purpose. The media has intentionally portrayed student efforts as mere uncivilized demonstrations. Today we have two goals. One is to remember Cesar Chavez's legacy. Um, like Cesar Chavez, we have the privilege of being citizens, but still fight for those who don't. We feel it is morally right to support a cause that, it, that is greater than ourselves. Um, our second goal is to educate students about the bills that have been proposed lately. I had the experience of attending the protest that was held last Saturday morning. As I arrived, I noticed the crowds of people chanting and standing on bridges. I was amazed at how so many different cultures were unified on that day. I was so overwhelmed and full of mixed emotions that I felt it was my duty to take positive action after that day. Listening to my dad's speech, as well as the other positive political activists, inspired me to speak out. One voice, one purpose. With all the negative images of Los Angeles students all over the media, we hope today will change that. We did not walk out to get out of class today. Today is our day off, but we have dedicated it, as well as the last week, preparing to be present today. We have come to share our opinions and voice our concern. Although they may seem as basic arguments, the truth cannot be set aside because of its simplicity. One being the idea that our whole nation is based on immigrants, all con contributing to the success of our country. Seeming well off, will we now put our borders on lockdown and ship all immigrants out? It is obvious that we have the legal power to send them back, but is it morally acceptable to send them back, especially those who have lived here for most of their lives? There is an ethical solution to all problems. Although immigration must be limited and, must, and action must be taken, there is no reason to jump to conclusions. And we must uh, conclusions and create extreme leg legislation that so many citizens may have hotly protested. We realize how difficult and chaotic the last few weeks have been. And with time winding down, we would like to present each of you with a certificate as a token of our appreciation for your support and time. Thank you on behalf of all of us students gathered here today. Um, will the guards please come and get the certificates? Thank you, and I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Reyes for brief comments. Thank you, <clears throat> you Council President. I, um, I found out last night I was coming home from my events that students were organizing from Cathedral and Sacred Heart of Jesus. And as they spoke to me, they made me very much aware of my daughter that tomorrow's our day off. I told her you couldn't be truants. It's a reason to get arrested. And they said, no, we're taking a day off. We want to say something positive. They felt the media was portraying the young people as derelict, crazy, unresponsible. They wanted to send a different message. They wanted to thank us for your support on the resolution. But more importantly, they, they want to take a step that is very concrete, that speaks to how they can influence the decision makers in Washington about the meanness of the bills that are right now being considered that penalizes innocent people who are trying to make a living in this country, a country of immigrants. So I want to thank them for their orderliness. I know we scared the guards and the police as we walked in, but they conducted like ladies and gentlemen. They followed the rules, and I believe they set a good example of our future generations. I want to thank them and love to give them a round of applause for their hard work and commitment. Congratulations.
Thank you, Mr. Reyes. We do have a couple of council members. I'd like to add my thank you to setting a very good example and, and being here. And uh, you should be very proud of your, your daughter uh, today, Mr. Reyes. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Cardenas and uh, Mr. Rosendahl for brief remarks. It's wonderful to see that the spirit of Cesar Chavez is still alive in our young people. Uh, he passed away probably, well, actually before all of you were born. Uh, Cesar Chavez passed away in 1993, and he left behind a legacy and a spirit that is about nonviolence. It is about change. It is about fighting against injustice. It is about treating all human beings as equals. When Cesar Chavez fought for farm workers, he fought for the people who, in my opinion, will inherit the earth, uh, as some scriptures say. But Cesar Chavez only had an eighth grade education. So with the, the kinds of things that were available to him in his life, the discrimination that he had to endure growing up and into his adult life, you don't have to deal with that to any degree of, of the level that he had to deal with it. Yet at the same time, somehow, some way, you've demonstrated to all of us, not only to the city council, but to the people of Los Angeles. And as I was just talking to somebody who's here uh, from France today, they said that that 500,000 people march uh, just a week ago actually was seen around the world. So I think it's very important for you to understand the impacts that you make, that at your young age, the actions that you take really, really do change the world and that we need to listen to you and we can grow by your example as well. So I just thought it's fitting that you come to us on this day, the birthday of Cesar Chavez, which I think is the best birthday in the entire year, just from my personal, personal reasons. But, but my bias. But at the same time, we made his, holiday, his birthday a holiday for a reason. And one of the things that we put in the state legislature, Herb Wesson and myself and our colleagues at that time, with the leadership of Senator Polanco, was to make sure that it was a day of learning and a day of giving. So it's wonderful to see that us as adults try to set something in motion. And it's great to see that you young people get it and you've got it and you're demonstrating it. So God bless you and thank you so much for getting it. Thank you. Mr. Ros Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, uh, I have mentioned to some of you outside um, before um, that what you're doing today is the backbone of making the democracy work. If we care about something, we should express ourselves. We should get out and we should do it in an orderly and peaceful uh, and in a democratic way. Today being the holiday of Cesar Chavez is the Friday where on the Monday uh, Marco Antonio Farabaugh um, was buried and we had a service and he was someone who fought so that kids can go to college no matter what their status is. So in memory of him, which we took off as a city as Cesar Chavez, now the city, the state and everything is taking off today. So what you're doing with your energy today, a holiday, is in keeping with the spirit of Cesar Chavez. Now, as for the immigration issue, I had mentioned to some of you that my parents were immigrants. And I am first generation, like many of you here are. My parents were lucky to come over between the First and Second World War from Germany um, for the land of opportunity. And I will say very clearly that the 12 million people here who are undocumented immigrants uh, should be given full amnesty now. These are families. These are mothers, these are fathers, these are uncles, these are aunts, these are your brothers and your sisters and your cousins. We're all tied together here. And if we can put it all in the sunshine and give everybody the respect that they deserve, we should do that as a nation. In fact, our immigrants, especially right now the undocumented immigrants, are making less wages than they should because they're on the edge of, of the shadow. Mr. And Mr. if you bring them excuse, into the excuse light, me, they'll Rosen, get better though. opportunity. So anyhow, congratulations on what you're doing. Thank you. Mr. Zine. Mr. City Attorney, I just got to make a couple comments for these uh, scholars. The future you're, leaders you're, of America. You're responding, briefly, you're responding briefly to their comments. I want to congratulate uh, everyone who has a birthday today and uh, yesterday, Janice Hahn, uh, and, and our students who are here in a responsible fashion. I want you to know that there is an organization called the National League of Cities, it represents cities across the country. 
and they formed a task force on immigration reform. And I am chairing that task force with representatives from throughout the country. And we understand the issues, the concerns. We understand what needs to be changed. We are a democracy in this country, and we go by the will of the people. National League of Cities is at the forefront, along with the City Council, to do what is right for the communities. I will assure you that when we hear 11 and a half to 12 million people who are considered illegal in this country, about half of those people entered this country legally. They entered this country with a visa, with a passport, and for whatever reason they overstayed or they changed the classification, there is no way that we in this country are going to start deporting people to other countries. On the other side of the coin, I will tell you also that they're very concerned about crime and violence and gangs, and if people commit crimes and violence and they're involved in gang activity and terrorizing neighborhoods, then all the elements of the criminal justice system, including deportation, are going to be utilized. But people who are trying to find the American dream that we've all found, that you have, that you're enjoying, we support that. This body supports that. We've gone on record supporting that, along with cities across the United States of thank, America. Thank you, Mr. Zahn. So what we ask for you is to get that education and become the future leaders of this wonderful United States of America. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you all for our comments. Just remember, colleagues, we have a one-minute response time um, we're trying to stick to today. Thank you very much. I'd like to call up our next uh, public comment uh, cards, uh, individuals who are here. Mr. Padilla, did you have a question? Just, just want to recognize item 36A, the amending motion for item 36 has been distributed. It's technical in nature. Uh, okay, if you'd like, we'll go ahead and adopt that now. Um, on 36A, uh, we have an amending motion. Um, Madam Clerk, if you could open the roll on that item, close the roll, tabulate the votes. Twelve ayes. Mr. Zahn, you have an introduction? If I could just have a brief moment for an introduction. And if I can please have the delegation come over to uh, CD3 position. Uh, we have with us uh, Joy Bedon, uh, Dearborn, Michigan, Ferris Wiebe, Rima Cato, and Gus Malkun. Uh, these representatives from the community are, are working with uh, my office and Councilman Garcetti's office on our sister city program with Beirut, Lebanon. These are some of the uh, people that are helping coordinate that. They're here today. The mayor of Dearborn, Michigan is here also uh, in meetings. But I just want to acknowledge them and welcome them to Los Angeles City Hall. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Zion. I'd like to call up Raymond Yu, followed by Samuel Sanchez, Sochi Lujan, um, and then I'll call the remainder. Good morning. My name is Raymond Yu. Yesterday, it was my 25th birthday, and you have not pray and celebrate my 25th birthday today, so I need you to pray and celebrate my 25th birthday today. So right now, I'm 25 in this April. Yes, and, and I had a birthday with my family last night, and uh, my birthday was successful. M but... Right now, I have some I have some great news. Okay, please note that the Chinatown Streetscape Phase Two North Broadway intersection light construction project will not begin by removing those existing old school classic marble stone orthogonal posts yet until the posts are delivered to Chinatown by the CTNF. The prototype brand new posts will be replaced by CTNF after they remove the old school classic orthogonal marble stone posts and upgrade the brand new traffic night which is in which is in spring but I'm waiting for the CTNF contractors to come to Chinatown to replace the brand new post after they remove the post. So this coming Sunday, uh, no, next coming this coming next coming Sunday, 16 April, Easter Day, Cathedral Our Lady of Angels whole day, and Sunday, 30 April, La Fiesta Broadway held in downtown LA. 8 a.m. through 7 p.m. on Broadway Corridor. And on next month, on Sunday, uh, Monday, 29 May 2006, Memorial Day Parade, but I might not attend because I'll be in the Cathedral or Lady of Angels on Memorial Day with Memorial Day Mass. And also on when they finish the Chinatown Streetscape Phase 2, they move to Phase 3, North Hill Street, plus Little Joe Demolition Project. We place the brand new building, Blossom School on North Broadway and College Street, Northeast Corner. Thank you. And have a safe day. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Samuel Sanchez, please. Thank you. Mr. Sanchez? Samuel Sanchez. Okay. 
He'll be followed by Sochi Lujan, Dele Aleman, and then Alberto Tolota. Um, can I? Uh, hi, my name is Samuel Sanchez, and um, I, I believe you guys know of the South Central Farm, and uh, some of you may not want to hear this, but I know of the Grand Avenue project. I know, you know, it's a huge project. It's going to be right at your doorstep. Over two, almost two billion dollars is going to be in, invested into this, and you guys tout it as. Uh, being good for the community, you're going to bring in restaurants. Who's going to be able to afford these restaurants? How far are you pushing this out of the reach of the, the lower income in the community? And, and what kind of conflicts of interest arise when you create a new government agency just to deal with projects that gentrify us and, and make us second, third, fourth class citizens? How are we going to afford, maybe we'll work there as a janitor, but we won't be able to afford the, the, the restaurants and shops. And, you know, I don't understand how, um, how you could allow council persons that uh, accept money from people like the Atreus or Atreus Consulting Group, whose client list contains like 99% developers. How can you allow them to appoint people that are also being audited for, and investigated for extorting uh, two million dollars from the city, such as Mark Williams, how can you allow them to appoint them to the advisory board for the district of South Central? That's not fair. That's not even legal. It, it, it's a huge conflict of interest. I don't see how it's not evident that the city is, the community is not being represented here. Those, uh, I'm at a loss for words because I understand the farmers have been coming here for three years. They've will continue coming here and I hope that you guys understand that the community really does not need billions spent in one place and neglected in others. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Sochi Lujan, Dele Aleman. Good morning City Council members. My name is Sochi Lujan. I'm with the Chicana and Chicano Studies Alumni Association at California State University Dominguez Hills. Uh, there was a comment made by Councilperson Parks in the LA Weekly this week regarding the South Central Farm and the 14 acres. Uh, I believe his statement was incorrect. I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, you can all look at the LA Weekly and see exactly what he said. But in the past 13 years, this 14 acres of land has enabled the community to reap several benefits, Mr. Parks. Numerous students from various schools inside and outside of LAUSD have had the opportunity to participate in several and various workshops in art and science which comply with K through 12 state standards, free of charge. Health fairs have also been provided with assistance of medical professionals from UCLA as a service to the community. It should also be noted that many of the volunteers who participate in providing assistance for the aforementioned workshops and fairs are respected community members who are teachers, college students, high school students, lawyers, doctors, and even some celebrity uh, figures have seen the South Central Farm as an important community resource. Instead of touting unjustified comments regarding the farm without even stepping foot in this vibrant community space, it would do some good for Ms. Perry, who I know for a fact has not been at the farm. Um, Mr. Parks, I'm not sure if you have been at the farm or not. Maybe you can correct me if I'm incorrect. Have you been to the farm? Maybe you can uh, let us know that. Um, but I don't believe you have. Um, but before making such comments, it would actually do some good for you uh, all to attend one of the student workshops that we offer or the health fairs to see what is actually happening there at the farm to service the community as a benefit. It really would uh, do you some good, all of the city council persons who have not been able to go out there to really see what a jewel and what it has to offer. There Thank are many you. benefits. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Uh, Dele Aleman. Uh, Alberto. And then we do have a number of He's other a separate south. from the farm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, 
Good morning, my name is Alberto Clatoa, and I would like to applaud the students who also came out here today and you know, have their voice heard, because that's what needs to be done to change things. I want to I wanna, uh, uh, hear, ask anyone to step up to the plate and, and pro ask you guys as a body of representatives of the city of Los Angeles and ask the mayor to proclaim the city of Los Angeles a sanctuary for immigrants just like the mayor of Maywood did. It's very fundamental because this city and nation has benefited from the labor and sweat of the immigrants that have come to this country and we cannot treat them like that. They are working class people who come to this country to work for what's right and to provide for their families something better that their homeland cannot provide for them. They're not criminals. So I'm here to openly ask you guys and the mayor to proclaim the city of Los Angeles a sanctuary for immigrants. And in the words of Cesar Chavez, you cannot oppress the people who are not afraid anymore. Thank you. Before we call the next uh, public speakers, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Rosendahl for a presentation. I would just love the Cantor Canyon Charter elementary school students to all stand up. We could have the cameras <clears throat> out on them as well. And we want to thank you all for coming to the Los Angeles uh, City Hall today and for Public Works for giving you a whole presentation. You're great kids and have a great life and a great future. Welcome to City Hall. Thank you, Mr. Rosendahl. And kids, if you watch TV tonight on Channel 35 at 730, uh, you'll be able to see yourselves on TV. It also reruns on Sunday. So. Um, Thank you. I'd like to, uh, we have a number of cards from the South Central Farmers. How about you, do we need uh, someone to translate? Okay. If we could have the translator. Good morning. Uh, mi nombre es Liberio Clatoa. My name is Liberio Clatoa. Creo que ya este, vengo a decirles como representante de nuestra comunidad. As a representative of our community, I'm here to tell you. Creo que es ahora que nos apoyen para salvar nuestro jardín. I think this is the time for you to support us to save our garden. Creo que como comunidad queremos, As queremos, a community, we want Queremos algo positivo para nuestra juventud, nuestros hijos. We want something positive for our youth, for our kids. Porque ellos los queremos ocupados, no en la calle. Because we want them busy, not out in the streets. Y otra cosa. Something else. Para nuestros mayores de edad, que ellos no, no son una carga para la ciudad. For our elderly, they're not a, a load to, for the city. Sino que son gente trabajadora. They're working people. Porque los campesinos mm -hmm. no duermen. We don't sleep, the gardeners. Siempre estarán alertas. We always alert. Gracias. Thank you. you can do yeah. Good morning, City Council. My name is Araceli Clatan. I'm a daughter of a South Central farmer and a LAUSD student. One of the Five-year-old girl children of one of the farmers came crying to me because she thinks that they're that that the garden is going going to be destroyed. I'm trying to make her feel better that it would I would do my best to fight and keep the garden from being destroyed. I felt that they were going to take away a safe place for our for the kids and adults and families around the area. And my question to the city council, are you going to let Leslie cry or are you going to give her some hope and support the farmers? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning once again. My name is Alberto Clatoa. I'm a South Central farmer and a current East Los Angeles College community um, student. When we call out to specific councilmen, our purpose is not to offend anybody. It's just to basically call out to the representatives of the city of Los Angeles to step up to the plate and to meet the necessities of our community. 
we have done this for, we've been coming here for three years, and I have not seen that personally from this body. So we're not here to, when we call out to a specific person, we're not here to offend you. We're just telling you, step up to the plate, because there is a necessity in South Central. It needs to be solved immediately. And I'm also aware that you guys supported a new commissioner to this uh, uh, the city. And basically, hopefully with her experience and her guidance, she could lead you to preserve this 14-acre oasis in South Central and lead for a greener LA. And also, I would like to invite, personally invite all of you guys to show your solidarity with the farmers and come and protest to commemorate uh, Cesar Chavez's legacy this Saturday. Uh, we're going to meet at the farm and then ha send a delegation to go over there and show uh, our support. And because la lucha continuará, the struggle will continue until people, we must fight for the injustices that are here. So, aquí estamos y no nos vamos. We've been doing it for three years and we're saying, we're still standing strong and united as a community that we are here and we're not leaving. Because this issue needs to be addressed immediately. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our last public speaker is uh, Roberto uh, Carbajal. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, I'd like to invite uh, everybody watching. Uh, what I'm going to speak about uh, is concerns of Simone Hotel. I hope you don't mind if I play you just a snippet of this digital tape. I'm sure you'll be able to hear it. I've played it at, uh, at the Board of Supervisors meeting before. Uh, this is from the Simone Hotel. This is a gentleman that's named Thacker, Jerry Thacker, and he's speaking about our caseworker, Yvette Nelson who rules over this place, who just testified against me yesterday on an eviction proceeding. You can find all, out all of the information at my website, robertocarvajal.itgo.com, or go to the uh, Yahoo Groups, my group. Uh, you can find it in the search in the Yahoo search engine under Elio Carrion. This is a recent testimony about uh, Yvette Nelson caseworker at the Simone Hotel that works under the Skid Row Housing Trust who, if you'll read my website, have reported to half the Southern California authorities, and nobody does anything. They're drug dealers, it's called the Skid Row Mafia, and they're racist as hell. My caseworker with HUD is Kelly Rubio. She's in the 714 area. I asked her, Mr. David Quisada with HUD, who is the director of both uh, Los Angeles and Santa Ana said, in April there's gonna be a county agenda, and verbatim that uh, it's gonna bring revolutionary funds and rules to protect the homeless and the NSA, excuse my voice. NSA means needs special assistance. This is our caseworker that's supposed to protect us at the small. Like, she's sitting here today. Oh, they're sitting right here. Hey, you know what they're worried about? They've built this fucking town. Black people have built this whole fucking town. They've got here. It's only because of white people that the reason the neighborhood is fall down to its knees. You say that? And a lot. Angela, say that. No, he's bad. He's bad. Angela, don't say that. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, that. Mr. Kihala, David Kihala with HUD, and see if you can get on this, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, and I contacted the HUD police. They're on the 37th floor of the same building of HUD. Okay. Uh, that's a Mr. Reyes, detective or agent Reyes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, I believe that uh, we have no other public comment cards. Um, that closes uh, public comment period. First order business. Uh, next special. item on the agenda, Madam President, is item number 16, and that was called special by Council Member Parks, and there is an amending motion that has been distributed. Mr. Parks, your amending motion has been distributed. Do you wish to speak on this item before we adopt it? Request is that the budget finance report uh, be moved. That's all. I'm sorry. Say that budget. we move the budget and finance report with the amendment you've with introduced the amending, today. Yes. Okay. Seeing no objections, that item will be before us with the amending motion, the budget and finance report. Madam Clerk, open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the votes. Twelve eyes. That item has been approved. Next item. Uh, next item, Madam President, is item number 30, and that was called special by Council Member Parks. Mr. Parks. Yeah. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, we're just asking for uh, community uh, support in uh, renewing this uh, $50,000 reward uh, for those who are responsible for the death of Steve Lynn Austin Sing Singleton, who was standing in front of 4610 South St. Andrews Place uh, when a gold-colored uh, Lexus approached him. Several as yet-to-be-identified suspects walked out of the vehicle 
Suddenly and without provocation, one of the suspects began to fire at Mr. Singleton. This occurred on Friday, March 26, 2004. Uh, ultimately, Mr. Singleton succumbs to his injuries. Uh, any information uh, from the public to assist uh, 77th detectives should be referred to Lieutenant Nathan at 213-485-4175. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Uh, that item is now before us. Madam Clerk, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the votes. 12 ayes. That item's been approved. Next item. Item number 31, call special by Council Member Hahn. Ms. Hahn. Thank you, colleagues. What we have uh, before us today is an opportunity to uh, offer a reward motion for a cold case. And this is a particularly disturbing case that happened uh, 23 years ago in 1983. Approximately about 2.30 in the afternoon, an eight-year-old girl, Victoria Brown, was walking home from school in Watts uh, when a blue van pulled up into the curb. Witness witnesses observed a male Hispanic on the parkway next to the van as Victoria walked past. Victoria reversed her direction and walked back towards the direction of the van, and the van drove away northbound on Anzac, um, then eastbound on 95th Street. The next day, approximately around 5 o'clock, young Victoria Brown's body was found in the trunk of a stripped and abandoned vehicle on the 1600 block of East Q Street in Wilmington. This area was near wrecking yards, junkyards, and the subsequent investigation revealed that she'd been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Detectives from the Southeast Division and subsequently Robbery Homicide Division have devoted hundreds of man hours investigating what was first the kidnapping and then murder. They canvassed both Watts and Wilmington. They interviewed numerous citizens, registered sex offenders, other potential suspects. No viable suspect was ever developed. But recently, of course, with the advances in DNA typing, Evidence has been examined and submitted to the California DNA database, but still with no results. Currently, robbery homicide detectives have been working with Colleen Williams at Channel 4 to have Victoria Brown's murder put back out to the public in an effort to generate interest and hopefully names of suspects. Last night, Channel 4, I don't know if any of you watched it, uh, actually began their several part uh, story on this and uh, ran the first part last night. To help generate the interest, the tech detectives have come to me and asked that we offered a $50,000 reward to anyone who can provide information that leads uh, hopefully to the arrest and conviction of Victoria Brown's murderer. Uh, even though it happened uh, 23 years ago. Uh, there, we think, is still a dangerous criminal, a threat to more children out there, uh, and I hope this reward helps us to catch this person and bring peace for little Victoria and for her family. So I hope you will agree with me today and approve this $50,000 reward. Thank you, Ms. Hahn. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Weiss. Thank you. I want to thank Ms. Hahn for bringing this motion forward. It's, it's very important. Um, we have the chance, unfortunately, to put motions in uh, at the request of the police department for rewards. Oftentimes, most times, they relate to recent crimes, but there, is, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of unsolved homicides, hundreds, probably thousands, okay. of unsolved sexual assaults that are sitting in the files of the LAPD. Anything we can do to help them clear those cases, we should do, and we absolutely should pass your motion, Ms. Hahn. 
I just want to note that we're going to have an opportunity in the budget process coming up to do something else um, to help the LAPD solve some of these unsolved cases. Um, and that is, I hope, we've got the chance to add resources both to um, the forensic side uh, of the LAPD and also to the detective side. Coming online uh, in the state of California over the next months and years, we're going to see hundreds and hundreds of cold hits thank to, thanks to Prop 69, which takes DNA samples from uh, convicted felons and uh, violent arrestees in the state of California. Um, we're going to start getting hits on these cold cases, perhaps on this very case here. Who knows? But once you get a hit off of DNA testing, that isn't the end of the case, that's the beginning of the case. Once you get the hit, you then have to give the case to the detective. The detective has to go out and work up the case for prosecution uh, and, and for arrest. So um, your, sing your following through on this today is a good reminder, not just for this case, but of the fact that we have the opportunity to add resources, in particular detective resources, so that when cases like this get matched forensically, they can then get matched um, legally as well. Thank you, Ms. Hahn. Thank you, Ms. Weiss. Thank you, Ms. Hahn, for bringing this to our attention. Um, we ask, uh, now the item is before us, Madam Clerk, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the votes. 12 ayes. That item has been approved. Next order. Item number 39, call special for a card from the public, and this is a finding of public convenience or necessity. Thank you. I'd like to ask Mr. Will Nieves. Mr. Nieves. Good morning. My name is Will Nieves. My address is 111 South Juanita Avenue, Redondo Beach, California, 90277. Thank you for this opportunity to speak here before you. Uh, this is an item that was originally on the, on the calendar on Tuesday, and it was uh, continued till today. First of all, I'd like to clarify the record. This is a, an existing full liquor license that has full line alcoholic beverages that is located at 1717 East Pacific Coast Highway. What they are proposing to do is to close down that particular location and relocate and transfer the license to the proposed location, which is at 1515 East Pacific Coast Highway. This happens to be two blocks to the east of, I'm sorry, to the west of the property, the existing uh, liquor store. It's proposed to operate two blocks west of where it is now. It is within the same census tract. It is on the same side of the street. What we are proposing to do is to renovate the rundown building that is located at the subject property. Uh, the owner will be investing over $200,000 to upgrade that particular facility. Um, it will be something that will be uh, an asset to the community. He has an existing operation already in place at 1212 East Pacific Coast Highway, which is another three blocks further west where he put in over $200,000 to upgrade that store that he has at that location as well. I have a petition that was signed and it's included in the file by over 400 people that are residents in the neighborhood that come to this particular uh, store. I also have a letter signed by a church across the street uh, from uh, the 1212 East Pacific Coast Highway location. Um, I also wanted to add some things here that I, I think the city council is not aware of. Whether you approve or deny this public convenience and necessity determination, the existing liquor store will remain in place. It will not go away. Uh, you have an opportunity here to incorporate corrective conditions delimiting it out, its hours of operations, the type of uh, alcoholic beverages it serves, and conditions can be placed on the license that are not placed on the existing location. If I could ask you to conclude. All right. Um, in conclusion, uh, we think that the denial of this application will not be in the best interest in light of the fact that corrective conditions can be imposed on the license and that there are residents in favor of this particular application. Uh, the particular owner is known in the community and has been there for many, many years. And I just think it's a travesty that just for a transfer it's being denied. Thank you very Thank you. much. I'd like to acknowledge Ms. Hahn. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, 
as I hope you know, I have been working since I was elected uh, to this council office to improve the quality of life uh, for the people that uh, live in Wilmington. And uh, we've done a lot of things to try to reduce the impacts uh, of, the, of the industrial port on residential community. We've done a lot in terms of our zoning to remove uh, container storage and junkyards from the community of Wilmington. Um, so I, I would ask that you would uh, join me today in denying this application. There is already an over-concentration of liquor stores in this area. Uh, this application is at our discretion. This is a high crime area of Wilmington. Uh, and there is no need in my mind uh, to have a, another liquor license uh, in this community. Uh, so I hope you'll agree with me and uh, deny this application and uh, again move towards working to improve the quality of life uh, for everyone who lives in Wilmington. Thank you, Ms. Hahn. Uh, seeing no other members on the speaker queue, uh, Madam Clerk, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the votes. 12 ayes. That item has been approved. Next item. Item number 40 was called special by Council Member Parks. Mr. Parks. Thank you, Madam President. I would ask the staff to come up uh, to highlight some of the issues in the uh, midterm report on the city's uh, financial standing and also uh, some of the issues that are relevant as we go forward on the next year's budget. Uh, Bill, why don't you give us a, a brief overview of our current financial standing uh, in the city and then uh, cover uh, some of the issues that were relevant in the committee that dealt with the uh, street services. I'll have Laura do the first part, okay. then I'll do the second part. We even have some supplemental information on a memo dated uh, March 28th that speaks to the structural deficit in response to um, Councilman Rosenthal's questions. Okay. Very good. Good morning. I'm Laura Guglielmo with the City Administrative Officer. Our current year revenue is expected to exceed the budget by $147.8 million. That's largely due to increases in property values, the increase in the documentary transfer tax, and the property taxes components of that. There's also a significant increase due to gas and telephone taxes, and economy-sensitive revenues such as sales, business, hotel, and parking taxes, reflecting the health of our local economy. We want to urge you not to continue to count on this additional revenue. Um, if you look at the additional revenue or the lack of additional re revenue over the last several years, 10, 10 or 12, 15 years, you see tremendous volatility in our revenue estimates compared to um, where the revenue actually came in. We're also concerned about communication tax revenue beginning in 2007-08 based on a review of current litigation. Our reserve fund balance is projected to be approximately $306 million on June 30th, and this assumes one point, I'm sorry, $13.2 million in early re reversions. We want to encourage also that we're going to need about $150 million to, to maintain the reserve fund in accordance with the financial policies for the 2006 proposed budget. Um, in terms of our, our current year revenue, I, it's my understanding that we have additional revenue that we've received subsequent to the publication of this report in business tax. Um, I don't have those figures. Bill, do you have them? We're tracking that right now. We're working with the Office of Finance. Based on money currently uh, received by the city, it's more than apparent that we will be exceeding our um, revenue target for business tax. As a consequence, the, uh, the business tax reform actions taken by this council last year will, um, will result in another reduction in business tax for next year. Be very good. It's a good thing. We've also <laughs> it's a good thing. We've also reported um, surpluses and deficits in various departments. Um, at the point in time that we wrote a report, it was um, approximately 33.1 million dollars in surpluses and shortfalls totaling about 39.5 million dollars. However, as we continue to evaluate and monitor every department, those numbers have changed. Um, of significance is the city attorney. They, at one time we were projecting a pretty significant deficit for them. At this point we believe that they will in the year on budget. We also have significant shortfalls in LAPD, street services, fire, general services, and general services. Um, the LAPD's shortfall is primarily driven by sworn overtime. 
but we are assuming $24 million in additional revenue due to LAX overtime and various grant and other reimbursements. Uh, this, there's a shortfall in street services of about $7.5 million due to the increased cost of construction materials. Um, our office had originally had recommended reducing those street miles by 25 miles to remain within budget and not need an additional appropriation. Um, obviously that's a policy decision on your part on whether you um, want to make an appropriation at this time. We do have that additional business tax revenue. Um, but of course we would love to see those funds go to the reserve fund and help support the strength of our overall financial picture. Fire's problem is primarily related to disaster relief um, due to their work on hurricanes, Katrina and Rita, and the brush fires in Payton Canyon. We hope to receive reimbursements from the federal and state governments uh, for those, but we are recommending a reserve fund loan of $1.7 million to help them in the current year. General services problem is primarily related to the increased cost of petroleum as well as natural gas, and they are also having problems with leasing. And as we reported, the city attorney is now okay. This, um, this report also recommends appropriations and transfers totaling $32.2 million for various bond and construction projects. Okay. We, we're uh, available for any other questions, and Bill will add. J just a few comments. The, um, Laura mentioned that we're seeing a period of unprecedented um, growth in a, several major revenue categories. What I, what I want to do is offer a wor word of caution because it's, a, it's more than apparent that we're experiencing a spike, albeit it's been a spike for at least a couple of years, in, in some areas about three years, especially for, for real estate, for documentary transfer tax. But you know both on a real and an anecdotal basis that our real estate sales have slowed considerably. But I, I want you to consider another, another fact. Some have said, well, with sales slowing down, that should be mitigated or offset by an increase in property tax because assessed values because of all the, all the sales has gone up consider considerably. Your property tax should go up. But we're also experiencing a reduction in the contribution rate, on, I'm sorry, the um, collection rate for property tax. Historically, we've been around 96 to 97 percent, we being on a countywide basis, based on county assessor information. Recently, it's, it's dipped down to about 92 percent. So I think what you're seeing is folks who speculated, who bought property on speculation, thinking they could flip it at one point in time. And now that they can't move it because property values are not going up, when that property tax comes due for that million dollar piece of property, they're saying, I can't pay it. And they, they'll probably pay it when they eventually do pay it, um, sell that property. That's something that's, that you need and we all need to watch very, very carefully because we have a spike in, obviously in documentary transfer tax. We have business tax, which is a good thing, but then we do have the obligations related to business tax uh, reform. And, and we also have um, you, something on the horizon for utility users tax, especially with, in the area of cell phones and how that tax is being challenged in court right now. And so what I'm trying to say is, although this money is coming in, we still need to be fiscally prudent. We shouldn't spend that money, especially for ongoing programs, because um, once you put it in to an ongoing problem, that represents that ongoing obligation, which is the heart of the, the structural deficit. And on that note, we gave you a supplemental memo um, or information, again, dated March 28th. And we, we at the request of Councilman Rosenthal, addressed the structural deficit issue. And basically, the bottom line is that a structural deficit occurs when ongoing expenses exceed your ongoing annual revenue. And, and we gave you some examples on, on how that occurred. And we talk about up until 2001, we didn't have a problem. But in 2001, we had a number of events that triggered what we characterized as a domino effect, which caused a structural deficit. In the budget for 2001-2, the city added over 1,000 positions. And now that's absolutely an ongoing cost. In the spring of 2001, the dot-com industry collapsed. And as a consequence, your stock market declined significantly and that's what started taking the state in a downward spir spiral. 
And that's when the state started taking money from us. It was almost 50 million a year at that point. Medical costs increased significantly, which impacted our workers' comp and health care costs. The consent decree was entered, um, we entered into a consent decree, which has added about $110 million to our general fund budget over the last four years. Bond programs, which are wonderful, absolutely wonderful, were approved by the voters. But the, the money from a bond program will, will pay for the bricks and mortar, will, will basically build the building. Your general fund must pay for the staff, for the materials, like for the libraries, for the books, or the fire stations, for the fire apparatus. We also put a very, very high priority on a number of uh, programs, and rightfully so, in the area of public safety, affordable housing, and in the city attorney's office. All very, very good programs, which add to your ongoing costs. And so, again, when you're, when you, when you're making, when your revenue is at one level and your costs exceed that, the difference between the two represents your structural problem. We've done a number of things to bring that in line. The most important thing this council, with, with the mayor's you know, assistance, uh, put in place was the financial policies. We have in our reserve fund today, we have almost 4% of the reserve funds, about 3.8. We have some obligations that will take that down somewhat. But there's, I know there's a collective um, commitment to keeping that reserve fund as high as possible. So that's, that's basically it. If you have any questions, we're here to, um, to answer any concerns. Bill, let me ask you, you mentioned the potential litigation that deals with the uh, cell phones. Uh, where are we on the Cleveland lawsuit and what uh, would the potential impact on the uh, budget? The, the, the Cleveland lawsuit has to do with um, paramedics um, who are working in the fire department and who were characterized as dual function paramedics. And it's a lawsuit. I know we've had a briefing here, and I believe a briefing here in council on that particular item. The, um, we're going through the dollar amount right now. It, it could be as much as, on an ongoing basis, about $4 million a year. On a, on a um, settlement basis, we'll have that dollar amount for you soon. Okay. The, the utility users tax, or the, 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 the tax we, we charge for cell phones, is something that could have a huge impact on the city. That could be up to $170 million of an impact. And that's being tracked, and we'll probably need a legislative fix as we move forward, because the, um, it, it, it's, it's one of the most frustrating lawsuits I've ever seen, where there's an argument between what constitutes a, te a telephone, basically. Is it a landline or is it a cell phone? And how do we, in the manner in which we structure the, um, the, the tax for that particular instrument, the cell phone? Yeah. The other thing I'd like to comment on is that during this uh, <coughs> fiscal year, we've not had to impose a freeze but in this report, you identified several departments that uh, have gone over budget. And at the direction of the uh, budget and safety, we asked you to meet with uh, those department heads. Is, is that transpired or is that scheduled? As part of the, um, I think you know we're in the process of hopefully, hopefully locking up the, the budget for, for next year. And through that process, we've talked to a number of the department heads. And it's our intent to, um, to bring that information back to your committee. The one thing that, that you did touch on is that everyone needs to know that because we didn't have a freeze this year, which is a good thing because some departments are being choked somewhat, we did add 750 positions to the city's uh, workforce. Now that is an ongoing cost, but even as a, con as a consequence, it's even more important for every city manager to be managing their resources as diligently and carefully as possible. Okay. Uh, let me just ask you also, uh, you mentioned uh, also that we've gotten new information from the city attorney. So item six, uh, would we appropriately delete that from this report? Yes, that'd be fine. So we make a motion to delete item six. Uh, also on dealing with the issue of street services, I didn't quite understand uh, we were going to uh, basically reevaluate from the budget and finance what we we're going to do. And what's the recommendation today as it relates to, uh, I believe, item recommendation 29? The, um, I know the principal concern in talking to a number of you, but particularly Councilman Smith, that, that um, the street repaving miles 
was of critical importance because, of, because we're seeing an unanticipated increase in, in one revenue source being business tax. It's our recommendation to, to stay with the, the number of miles originally placed in the budget and the, the Prop 42 miles, which would keep us at uh, 225 miles for the year and not reduce it to 200 miles as recommended in our original um, uh, mid-year financial status report. Okay. So we stay at 225 yes. and not, uh, not pull out the 7 million that was originally recommended? Well, what we would do is we would need um, 3.5 million to keep it at 225. 2.5? 2. 2. 2. 2. Uh, 3.5. 3.5. Okay, yes. let me ask Mr. Robinson, would you come up and ju just for the council to be aware of what is it that you're going to accomplish uh, between now and the end of the fiscal year. Good morning, Council Members. Bill Robertson, uh, Bureau of Street Services. Uh, based on uh, the CAO's recommendations, we will maintain the 225 miles of street resurfacing. Uh, we were funded this year for an additional 24 miles of a combination of dirt streets and alleys. Uh, by working with each individual council office, we will maintain your priorities based on uh, the dirt streets and the alleys. Uh, but the, the cuts that we need to make up, the approximately, I believe it's three and a half million bill that we'll have to cut, um, we should probably be uh, a minimum of 235 miles total, 225 with 10 miles of dirt streets and alleys. And if we maintain our costs as we progress, we may even do more alleys. Okay. Let, Bill, why don't you explain to the council also what you had discussed in, in budget and finance about uh, the issue of reconstructing uh, the ability for street service to make their own asphalt and what might be the investment over the next several years? There's an issue right now regarding recycling um, the, the, uh, the asphalt or the aggregate that is that's, that's, that's the result of reconstructing streets. And we would need to uh, to rehab our current asphalt facility to achieve that goal. And what we thought, and, and is one of my strong recommendations and bills, that we, we would invest money into rehabbing our existing asphalt facility to allow us to recycle what, what Bill can't claims to be um, 65 years of materials that, that's on our existing streets. So that's something that we would like to work on. It's something that could be funded through the MICLA program it would be one of the best investments we'd make because our costs are being driven by um, the cost of petroleum, a cost for, for street materials by the cost of petroleum. This year alone, um, Bureau, of, Bureau of Street Services has seen a 53% increase in material costs, which has impacted our ability to repave you know, as many miles as, as we originally intended to pave, repave. My final question is that if we go along the current uh, path that we're on, uh, is it your perspective that we will not have to go through a freeze throughout this fiscal year? Or are we in, in good shape in that regard? Or, or, or just where are we on that issue of freeze? Yes, I would not recommend a freeze through the um, end of this fiscal year, but I would strongly recommend that each department head uh, exercise their diligence and, and their um, the best judgment in, de in deciding what positions are being filled and not just fill you know, everything and, and anything. So basically you're saying if they have vacancies doesn't mean that you should automatically fill them, that they, they need to use some discretion they, at least through the end of this fiscal year. They need to exercise their best judgment. Yes. Okay. Thank Ms. you. Parks, uh, you may have some more questions or time is up. You want to push your button again or are you, you're finished? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garcetti, followed by Mr. Smith, followed by Mr. Rosendahl, and Mr. Zine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam President, and thank you to our, our budget chair uh, for his able hands and um, steady steering of, of the budget. And thank you for the CAO's office always. As long as, Bill, you're up there, let me ask you something uh, real quick on some of the alleyway stuff, and then I'll uh, have a couple of general questions. To what degree, I was talking with um, a professor over at USC that deals with a lot of uh, of environmental issues and, and some of our propo and, and water supply issues, to what degree are we looking at permeable um, alleyways for the paving? Um, are we just kind of doing old-fashioned asphalt that'll flow the stuff out to the ocean? Right now, we've uh, 
matter of fact, we've been looking at uh, both uh, permeable concrete and asphalt. Uh, our good friends over at the uh, uh, General Services Department Standards Division has been working on a mixed design uh, for concrete. We have looked at a number of other locations um, where permeable asphalt is being used in, in parking lot and smaller applications. Um, the, the problem with permeable asphalt, uh, where that has been uh, extremely successful is when you can trap the water. It's used primarily in a lot of rural areas, been very, very successful. Our problem is because we're in an uh, urban environment that uh, we have structures underneath the ground that we can't trap the water and, and get the water away. Mm -hmm. We see a huge uh, opportunity uh, to utilize permeable asphalts in parking lots, city facilities. Matter of fact, we plan uh, right now with the CAO's help, we have two of our maintenance yards that are uh, going to be reconstructed and we plan to, to use permeable asphalt in areas uh, in, in that facility just to see how it works how easy it is to maintain. The biggest problem with some of the uh, permeable asphalts right now is that there are so many gaps. It's a gap graded material. And once those gaps fill with dirt, mm -hmm. it slows the flow of water. So we want to look at that. How best can we clean that? Do we need vacuum sweepers to ensure that we get the water mm -hmm. to flow through the asphalt? Uh, we are taking a very hard look at it, but we see a huge opportunity as we continue to build libraries, fire stations. Uh, the, but, but not in alleyways? In no, area. not in alleyways right now because of, in our alleyways we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, private property structures that are right on the edges right. uh, and we just don't have the room right now to put the water somewhere and, okay. and get it to drain properly. Okay. Um, for our, our CAO, so th I know one of the things that we pushed for in the, the, the budget was the UB for the 10th man or 10th uh, fighter team. So. Is that something that we can, I think the deadline is coming up right around now, um, or a couple days that we can move as part of this mid-year adjustment? Yes, that's something we can move forward now. Okay. I, I would move that we, we do that piece, that we take that from the uh, UB if, if, if your recommendation is that we're personnel-wise structurally ready to, do, to spend that yes. money. Yes. Okay. Um, and then, then lastly, um, in looking at, um, I wonder if you could quantify um, this year what additional uh, what the cost has been of new programs is that something that's in the mid-year like overall as we as we get a kind of snapshot of trying to see um, that we're keeping consistent with what our new sources of revenue are and make that consistent with our financial policies that we can only do new programs with that do we ever do a, a collection of overall because I know it's easy to say um, with a new program okay here's a specific source but when there's new program with overall growth that's a di more difficult thing to quantify uh, because people don't have that. Do we have that number at all? Well, it's, it's not in the report. It's not in the mid-year report. I believe that will probably be something we'll address in the budget. Okay. If we could, I think that it, we don't need it today. It would be a very useful thing. Just for this council to keep track of this year with the mayor, we've increased in terms of new programming, not growth of existing programs, by um, X amount of dollars. And if we have increase in revenues, which is covering increase in costs of given programs, we can actually know exactly what we're playing with um, there. The that we just need a caution that our increase in revenue are not new revenue sources, but just one-time increases above what we thought we would receive. So that would not justify adding a new program. And, uh, what we would need to do is add a new revenue source, for example, a new fee, um, in order to address the needs of a new uh, program. Unless, unless, I think there was a unless we felt that there was that they weren't one-time increases. That there was, if we felt Unemployed. comfortable, there was a permanent growth of something for yeah, whatever correct. reason. And then one, one last thing, um, we spend a lot of time in D.C. looking at uh, new telecommunications um, uh, legislation that's being proposed. Mr. Padilla has been very good at raising this as well. Um, are we uh, preparing for the possibility of, of some of the revenue streams that we uh, enjoy from telecommunications, not cell phones, but cable specifically, um, what that represents to the city in preparation for this? I think we need to have a defensive strategy should some of that legislation go forward. Obviously, the cities around the country are opposed to it, both revenue sources but also in terms of, of local control of programming. But um, is that something that you've been keeping a careful eye on? We're watching it very carefully. And in fact, uh, the mayor convened a, um, is a telecommunications task force for the express purpose of looking at and tracking this issue. The, um, I mentioned earlier we will need a legislative fix 
to bring clarity to the issue. And that's to, on the cell phone piece, right? Well, this is the cell phone but, piece. But on, 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 the cable? on the cable piece, it's, it's not as large a concern as it is as the cell phone mm -hmm. um, problem, you know, creates. But uh, we are tracking both. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Before I acknowledge Mr. Smith, um, we do only have 10 members present, uh, colleagues, um, and some of us are excused within the next half hour or so. So uh, just a uh, fair warning of us, uh, our brevity was appreciated. Thank you. Mr. Smith. I know I talk too much, so I'll right. be very yes. concise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I thank Mr. Parks for bringing some of those issues up. When we were in committee, uh, Ms. Gruel, myself, Mr. Rosenau were very concerned about reductions in streets resurfacing programs. I'm happy to hear that you've identified the sources. Uh, Bill uh, Robertson, for the record, the magic number to just maintain the minimum standard necessary just to break even uh, so we don't lose uh, uh, the, uh, the effort that we, you know, get behind our resurfacing program is 220, 221 miles, something like that? Actually, the, the number that we need to maintain the street system in its current condition, that's no improvement, number. just maintain it. 260 miles, okay. just so, to maintain it. So even at two and a quarter this year, we're falling behind again. Yes, but uh, the, the key thing is, is the, and the tool that has been very successful for us is the ramping up of our slurry seal program, which is now at 300 miles for this year. That is, uh, while our resurfacing has gone down a little bit, uh, that additional slurry seal is going a long ways and kind of holding things down, so it's slowing the rate of deterioration quite considerably. Yeah. It tolls the clock, uh, yes. essentially. So what we've been doing really just is maintaining and not making any progress, but not. Yes. So, a re but a reduction of 25 miles is 11 percent would have taken us well below that minimum yes. effort, and that's a critical part that the committee said very clearly. So what we have today is a proposal now by Mr. Fujioka that we fill that gap, finish off the plan for this year, and keep on target at least, if not making any headway. So that's important, I, and we haven't made a motion so. Uh, Mr. President, I think we need a verbal motion that we amend the report to state, as uh, identified Mr. Fujioka, that we'll maintain the 225 miles of standard resurfacing. Okay. And, uh, I'll second that. that. And with that, we we'll be Mr. adding, uh, moving 3.5 million 3 .5 from million. our reserve for economic um, emergencies. Okay. okay. Uh, certainties. That would be the motion. And then Before secondly, that, second for Mr. Rosendahl. And then the second issue is, is dealing with the, the infrastructure, and that is the recycling plant it needs to be upgraded to take advantage of the economies that we get from doing that. Uh, and we believe we can do that through MICLA funding. We believe that a mere um, uh, change to the structure can give us tremendous economies over the coming years. And so I think we need a report back from the CLA, uh, CAO on uh, financing of that and how quickly we could do that, what approximately it's going to cost. And so my second motion, Mr. President, would be amending motion to request the CAO a report back on the necessary improvements to the recycling plant and the funding sources available to do I'll that. I'll that, too. And with that, Mr. President, I'm done. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mr. Rosendahl. Yeah, I've second both of Greg Smith's motion. They're both uh, very forward-looking, and I appreciate you doing that. Uh, I know we're going to lose a quorum, so I'll be real quick. It's the only question I have in this whole business, which is the $271 million structural deficit the mayor talks about. Just very simply, tell me what it is and how we get rid of it, Bill. Well, basically, it's what I had mentioned earlier and it's, it's, it's listed in our, or described in our, sup, our memo dated March 28th, it's the title of Supplemental Information. And it's, when you're, it's when your ongoing expenses exceed your ongoing revenue. That. Right. That, that's the, the difference. The, um, what, what we're tracking right now is, um, you know, through the mayor's proposed budget, is identifying how identifying efficiencies in departments to reduce those ongoing expenses. It's looking at how we enhance our, our, you know, the collection of our revenue in the current, um, in, a, in, a, in various current categories such as um, business tax was the best example. And looking at how we, through our audit, um, audit, auditing efforts can increase the collection of business tax. It's, it's also increasing our um, the amount of money we place in the reserve and the amount of money we do not add to um, 
if not ongoing programs, with, but not creating new programs without identifying an ongoing revenue source. So it's a collection of many, many actions that all boil down to strong fiscal discipline. Now, the last thing I forgot to mention is that there's this rumor that we have half a million dollars sitting in an account somewhere doing nothing. Half a what? Half a billion dollars sitting in an account somewhere doing nothing. And yet the controller's report clearly stated that, yes, we had an increase in revenue last year, but $295 million of that increase was transferred from the reserve fund to the fiscal year 0506 budget. That is another, that also highlights a structural problem we have in the budget because we cannot rely on one-time transfers from the reserve fund to balance the budget. When you do that year after year, and we have done that for a couple of years, it, it, it creates a very hazardous situation. But that money absolutely is not sitting there. It was transferred into the budget. And a document this one group re refers to clearly shows the money was transferred in to this fiscal year's budget and it was used to balance this budget. Okay. Just let me say this, Bill. We're going to go through a process with you through April and May where yes. we, the council, will interact with the mayor's proposed budget. And I will constantly ask the question about the structural deficit. What is it and how do we get rid of it? I understand. And when we do all of that, I'm, I'm very comfortable that by the time July 1 comes, we will have clarified to such a degree that everybody will understand it. Thank you for Great. all your Thank leadership. You. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Zine is our next speaker. No, no. Give it up. Let it go. Mr. Fujoka, you mentioned uh, new parcels, et cetera, and how some of our taxes have gone up and the revenue sources are flowing pretty well right now. In downtown Los Angeles, office buildings that are being converted to lofts and condos, do we then receive additional compensation from each of those office buildings that have hundreds of uh, condo units being established and the new developments such as North End of Union Station, there's an explosion of uh, residential units being established in downtown Los Angeles, which were previously well, office buildings, I think, under Proposition 13. Do we receive additional revenues or are they still under the old Prop 13, even though they're being converted from commercial to residential? No, they won't be impacted by the old Prop 13. There's a yes and no to, no well, to that. If, yes, if we you, will. If you turn an office building, into four or five hundred residential units and you sell those as condos, do we receive the compensation on each of those sales? Yes. Okay, but so that's... There's that's a word of caution. Yes, the, uh, the office buildings that are being converted to condos will result in documentary transfer tax when, when they're sold and additional property tax um, following the, um, the sale of that property. And there's hundreds but, of those. But the one thing I'd caution, those projects are very, very visible. They're right in front of you right now. On a citywide basis, in the last couple of years, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of, of properties sold that resulted in our, in our documentary transfer tax going from, well, this year we thought it would be at 150, we'll close at 215 million. So 150, 215 million. And we get half of 1% for the, of the sales price for every property. So you can see that. That's thousands of properties. And just because we have a thousand properties downtown in the form of new condos or conversions and so on, and they're very visible to us right now, it, it doesn't even come close to um, equaling the thousands of properties that were sold the past few years and with the real estate market flattening out and going down. So that revenue in documentary transfer tax, I guarantee you, will, will not be next year will not be at this year's level. It I just agree. won't be. But the fact is, when they sell those units, that's additional revenue. And if it's in a CRA zone, do we still receive on the new compensation package, even though it's in the CRA zone, or does that all go funnel into the CRA? Because the downtown corridor has a number of CRA areas. Do we then receive additional revenue, which can help with our finances, or is that all then, that increase, diverted? Because if you look at some of these old buildings that are under Prop 13, the old hotels, the abandoned places that they're converting all over downtown Los Angeles, the additional revenues. But are, if they're in a CRA area, does that money then get diverted, or can we use that for general fund well, purposes? Well, the documentary transfer tax is still ours. The property tax, I believe, is still ours, depending on the, uh, the, the actual building. 
and even I have though to get back to you on a building by building basis. Because I'm concerned with the, the CRA developments. It seems that it's used its purpose and they are going through redevelopment. So the dollars that would traditionally go in should then generate additional dollars into the general fund for all of the purposes that we have. Some will. We'd have to get back to you on a case by case basis. And we, we have unresolved contracts. Uh, is it anticipated that some of this revenue will be used to resolve some of those unresolved MOUs that we have outstanding? I think, um, you know, on, on that particular note, everyone thinks that we have that a little spike in revenue, not you, Councilman, but a little spike in revenue should be dedicated to unresolved contracts. But yet, in my, in my strong recommendation is not to do that because not to give people more money or give people money more than what we gave other similarly situated employees. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm just talking well, about selling. I'm not talking about something else uh, extraordinary. But what I what I'd caution is that you have a spike in revenue. You have more money one year, whereas if you increase the salary of any classification, it represents an ongoing expenditure at right. that level, and so you can't expect that spike to stay with you on an ongoing basis. So there's that careful balance between, well, whenever you negotiate salaries, you have to look at the ongoing obligation. And so I just ask that, and I know you sit on EERC, that when we look at future contracts, we'll look at them as carefully and as responsibly as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank also, you. Also, our, pro our yes. projections reflect the fact that we will be- Projection for what? Our projections in our mid-year report, in terms of surpluses, revenues, and our total um, bottom line reflects the fact that we anticipate paying those um, employees who have not settled yet for the at the levels that we've settled with okay. other unions. I understand. And, and Mr. Bill Robertson, keep paving those streets, trimming those trees, fixing those he, sidewalks. He does a yes, great sir. job. We appreciate it. <laughs> I didn't want to leave you out of the conversation. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Thank you very much. That is our last speaker. Anybody else wishing to be heard? If not, let's open the roll on the money, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. As amended, that is approved. Thank you very much. Uh, our next item is item number 41. And my understanding that uh, we'd like to hear from the city attorney first on this, Mr. Rosno? Okay. We can ask the city attorney to come forward on item 41. And uh, if there, we do have public speaker cards on this that we may o reopen public comment for following that based on a motion from a council member. Welcome, Madam City Attorney. Susan Fan, Assistant City Attorney. Uh, we're here because of a report our office submitted uh, in connection with some litigation involving the Play Vista property. Uh, we uh, appeared here approximately a month or so ago to ex explain the litigation to you, but briefly stated it, it relates to a 2001 action of the City Council in approving a CLA report that related to methane. Um, the litigation uh, itself now Although it's still pending, there has been a judgment issued, and the judgment requires you to take a certain action, and that's why we're here today to, act, to ask you to take that formal action. And the writ, the, uh, writ that was issued uh, uh, orders you to, quote, vacate your approval of the methane mitigation measures for the Playa Vista first phase project for the purpose of determining whether a subsequent EIR or a supplemental EIR is required with respect to groundwater dewatering. And that's the language that shows up on your agenda. And that's the language that we're recommending that you adopt now. Uh, so you understand this was language that was issued by the court. The form of the language and the exact wording of the language was agreed upon by the three parties to the litigation, the opponents, the city, and the developer. Um, about two months ago when we came to you to explain the effect of the litigation, you did take some action in connection with this. You ordered the CLA to hire some consultants to do a study on this issue of groundwater dewatering. The CLA has done that. Uh, the matter will be coming back to you with the results of that. You will have an, an opportunity to uh, uh, come to some conclusions about those studies and take further action at that point. We ultimately need to report to the court in July with the effects of all of that. But what's before you today is rather narrow. We're just asking you that you adopt this language. Uh, just so you are aware, there are some matters pending in front of the Department of Building and Safety and the Planning Department 
relating to the effect of this court order on the ongoing activities at Playa Vista. Those matters will initially be decided by uh, those departments in accordance with the city's codes and are appealable up through the Board of Building and Safety Commissioners and then ultimately those matters can come back in front of you on the uh, specific factual situations. That's not in front of you at this point. It may be at some future point. So uh, that's all we have right now. We would uh, recommend that you adopt the recommendations in our report and uh, that's it for now. Thank you. And of course I support you on that and colleagues I would like all your support on that. I know we're on a tight time frame because we need to keep a quorum here. Before I ask Jerry to give us an update on, on what the City Attorney's Office said that you were doing, I want to ask you, um, City Attorney, uh, just two quick questions, okay? Uh, question one, uh, I understand this action we are taking today will have different applications in different scenarios. For instance, the developer could seek a building permit in area with methane. That area may or may not need dewatering. Both the developer and the plaintiffs will ask if, and after this action, the developer is allowed to get that permit. Or in another scenario, construction might be partially completed, and both the developer and the plaintiff might wonder if a certificate of occupancy could be issued under those circumstances. And three within that same scenario uh, is a third scenario. Construction might be substantially completed, but a certificate of occupancy has not been issued. Both developer and plaintiff might wonder if building and safety must now withhold a certificate of occupancy. How would you advise the Department of Building and Safety in these different scenarios? Uh, that's the, the determination of how the Building and Safety Department should act, uh, first of all, would be, is currently in front of them. And there are a number of factors that would be relevant to their determination, whether how far the construction has gone, some of the factors you indicated there, uh, the presence of other parties, whether the building's occupied, whether there's a safety hazard, whether any of the code, uh, codes have been violated and so forth. And because of that, that we believe that it should be initially determined by the Department of Building and Safety. To the extent that we gave them legal advice with respect to that court order, that would be protected by the attorney-client privilege. Now, we can go over with you under certain hypotheticals about how we might advise that based on a certain set of facts, but it, because it would affect the pending litigation, because anything that we really say here is attorney-client advice, we would strongly recommend that if you want to have that discussion now, that we do it in closed session. Mm -hmm. um, however, we think that those issues can be sort of worked out with the Department of Building and Safety, and they will ultimately come back to you at any rate if, if you wish to consider them. And so what we would say now is, I guess just as a general rule, to the extent that the court's order affects building and safety, it really only relates to situations where dewatering is involved. Mm -hmm. That we can say. Uh, but to go beyond that, again, would be something we'd want to do in closed session. Okay, and the second question is, if someone, either the developer or the plaintiff, disagrees with the direction given by Building and Safety, what are their opportunities to appeal this decision? Okay, the City's Municipal Code provides for an appeal to the Board of Building and Safety Commissioners, and then, of course, City Council has uh, Prop 245 authority over what uh, commissions uh, say. So it could come back here. Thank you very much. And, Jerry, just a quick update on where we are in the peer review process. Very briefly. Uh, we have hired uh, did two firms to do peer review, uh, uh, Fergo West and Geocon. Uh, they're firms that had no involvement with the city, Playa Vista, uh, the opponents, uh, Southern California Gas, so they are uh, independent. Uh, they've already overseen the installation of a well that the water board required relative to measuring the plume. Uh, they'll be looking at the reports and doing an analysis of that. They will be, be reduplicating some of the testing to confirm the validity of the data. Uh, we are uh, be working with your office to have two public hearings in the May time frame, uh, one with the initial re uh, report results and the other will be to respond to what the public comments are. We would expect to be back before the council in the June time frame uh, so that you can consider this before the July court date. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that and thank you Mr. President for allowing thank me you. to ask those questions. I know there's some public cards. If we could do a 10 minute okay. possible public Sure, hearing. we have, we have so five public, public speaker cards obviously in any of, of the two minutes that people want to give back to the bank. We're always happy to keep that earning interest for you. Um, George Milstein is our first speaker. Dan Cohen is our second. And Patricia McPherson is our third. 
Honorable Council Members, George Milston, Latham & Watkins, representing Playa Capital. Uh, we are here today to urge you to adopt the report as proposed by the City Attorney. Uh, this is a relatively narrow matter that is before you. Uh, the writ of mandate that is before you has been approved by Council for all parties. That includes the City Attorney, Council of the Opponents, as well as Playa Capital, and has been ordered by the Court. Uh, we believe the form of the order is correct, and you should move forward on that basis. Uh, arguments were made at the court hearing to expand the scope of the order uh, to require a supplemental or subsequent EIR. The court rejected those options. In addition, there were arguments before the court uh, to require uh, a further vacation of all systems at Playa Vista, and the court rejected those options. Uh, we believe the order that is before you is appropriate, and we urge your approval of that order. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dan Cohen is our next speaker. Um, yes. I would like to respectfully request uh, and put you on notice that at this time you need to inform everyone related to this, all the property owners, the banks, the title companies, anybody living and working in Playa Vista, that uh, by vacating these methane mitigation approvals, it affects their ownership of the buildings, the saleability, and um, I believe there's a lot of these plaintiffs, uh, the property owners, that were never informed of this le legal action, and I, I believe that you're legally required now to notify all these people that there has been this substantial change uh, in this court decision regarding the value and uh, the saleability of their property. Uh, I think also the bonds that underlie this project were predicated on the approval of this methane mitigation system and uh, the state holders and, and the governmental agencies involved with the issuing of these bonds need to also be put on notice legally. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia McPherson is next, to be followed by Paul Herzog and then uh, Marcia Hansen. My name is Patricia McPherson. I'm president of Grassroots Coalition. I was party to the lawsuit that we won in court um, regarding these, uh, the environmental issues at the Playa Vista site. Um, I would like to bring to your attention that um, what we are looking for here is accountability. Um, what we have not gotten to this point is accountability. The court gave you the opportunity to do an environmental impact review that would be reviewed by the state. Our city councilman asked for that environmental review that would have state oversight. This city council denied that from happening and instead chose this tiny, narrow, city-controlled study of these issues. We still ask for an SEIR to be performed. I bring to your attention lack of accountability. When the city council approved these experimental safety measures in 2001, they also directed the building the safety department to do annual reports on these systems, including a task force that would be made up of the public and state agencies to look at these systems to determine whether they are working, whether they aren't working, can they work better? 2001, this is 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. It still has not happened. This city's council ordered the city planning department to have state oversight through a state uh, sequel monitor for these gas safety measures. 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. It still has not occurred. I filed municipal, I filed uh, complaints with the Building and Safety Department for violations of the Municipal Code. Um, the City Attorney has just told you that there is a process to go through the Building and Safety Commission. What happens prior to that? Right now we're in a position of tactics that delay, sanitize, and jeopardize the public's health. What she doesn't tell you is that with Building and Safety and these filings that have been there for weeks, nothing has occurred to forward this process before the Building and Safety Commission. And I ask you, Mr. Weiss, if I can ask um, you why is it as uh, chair of the Santa Monica Bay Excuse Restoration me, Project, you would lead Excuse the me, fight to stop the state could have your attention, of these issues could I have rather you? than okay. having state oversight. That is your time, ma'am. Thank you very much. Paul Herzog is our next speaker. I'm sorry, ma'am. We, we try to be very even with the public and have two minutes each. So if you could please let our next speaker come. Thank you. Uh, Paul Herzog, thank you. Um, I've been to several of these hearings, and Mr. Milstein continues to defy logic in saying that the court rejected an expanded scope of study. The court said, in fact, as was stated by Ms. Fan, 
to do further study to determine whether an SEIR should be done. So, Mr. Milstein, I would appreciate next time you just say what was in fact decided, not what you think was decided. More importantly, uh, while we support further study of health and safety impacts of dewatering, the court, in the court record, and in fact a notebook that all of you received, I hope you've had someone in your staff read the notebook and the information that we give you, said that there's substantial evidence in the record that says that there are health and safety risks from dewatering. It's already been stated in the record. It's not up to Mr. Milstein. It's been up to the court and experts. But more importantly, you've seen this week two articles in the LA Times about TCE trichloroethylene. It's a degreaser. I wonder if this has been used um, at the Playa Vista site. Number two, we saw flooding this week at Lincoln and Jefferson. Obviously, it's a high water table in the area. It's a floodplain and a wetlands. I think it's pretty clear that when you have a high water table and you remove the water, there's a chance of subsidence, again, cited in the record. And secondarily, the toxic plume that exists on the east end of the property, if you remove water, there's a likely chance that that plume will spread, possibly into drinking water, something that was even dealt with in this LA Times article. These are not new issues for the state. And in fact, um, the agency that really has expertise in this, the uh, Department of Toxic Substances Control, should be called into this process. And lastly, in the motion that you all passed, it said that you'd consider two public hearings in Council District 11. When will you schedule those hearings? We really need to bring in those that are expert on this, as opposed to uh, defendant's attorneys, to determine what are the health and safety risks, because we don't want to wait till we have a situation like was reported in the newspaper. Thank you. Marsha Hanscom. Honorable Council Members, my name is Marcia Hanscom. I'm representing the Coastal Law Enforcement Action Network and the Wetlands Action Network. And I would like to respectfully request that you really carefully look at this order. This order, which I do hope you pass, says to vacate and to determine whether or not an SEIR is required or what kind of further study might be required. Therefore, I think you need to hire more than the consultants that the city attorney has suggested. I think you need to hire a CEQA expert to help you because the last time um, apparently you didn't get the best advice you could have. And I think you need to have an expert tell you whether or not a full EIR is required to look at this very important health and safety issue. Um, everything for phase two is predicated on phase one. And if the court felt strongly enough about these problems, I think that it's important for you to look at them. Um, you have a university immediately adjacent to this with dorms and classrooms besides the people living at Playa Vista who are impacted or would be impacted if this health and safety issue is um, as the court questions. And finally, a, a great deal has been um, made about whether or not there's even the sufficient time has gone past. The last EIR for phase one that was approved was in 1995. This is 2006. CEQA requires that after 10 years, you do need to do a new study, particularly on the eastern end of this property where DreamWorks was going to go. There are no structures there now. Nothing has been built. And there has been dirt moved around a lot, but it seems to me that given all the uh, surrounding development in the area, cumulative impacts that have been taken, all of that needs to be analyzed besides what the court is ordering, ordering you to determine. And that's why it's really important, I think, that you get a CEQA expert to come in and tell you whether you need a, a new SCIR or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is our, our last speaker card. Um, anybody else? Was going to be heard, Mr. Rosenthal, would you like I to? I want to thank my someone's... colleagues for being here at this moment. I know we're all on a tight schedule. I want to thank the public. I want to thank Playa Vista for coming and speaking on the subject. And I recommend we just approve this and move okay. it forthwith. All right. Thank you. Let's prepare the roll on the item and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved, and that will go forthwith. Thank you. Next item, please. Item number 42, call special by Council Member Parks. Mr. Parks. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is another uh, public appeal. Unfortunately, we had another homicide in the 8th District. Uh, this one's far more recent, uh, Friday, August the 26th, uh, 2005, approximately 8.50. Uh, Melvin Green, 58 years old, uh, was at a service station at 5816 Southwestern Avenue, whereupon a suspect uh, yet to be identified uh, drove over him as he exited the service station. 
uh, while going uh, northbound on Southwestern Avenue. He drug Mr. Green for approximately one mile before he was dislodged from the vehicle. Mr. Green was rushed to the local hospital where unfortunately succumbed to his injuries four days later. Uh, after an exhaustive investigation, LAPD has not been able to identify new information or develop clues that would uh, bring these, uh, this suspect to justice. Uh, we're offering a $50,000 reward and ask that any information uh, that deals with this August 26, 2005 circumstance be forwarded to 77th Street Lieutenant Nathan at 213-485-4175. Thank you very much, Mr. Parks. If nobody else wishes to be heard, let's prepare the roll on the item and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. We'll go forthwith on that. And 29 forthwith as well? Okay. Um, we have a special uh, one. If the city attorney can speak to the findings, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Since the posting of today's agenda, the city has learned that SB 1767 has been amended, which would affect the LAPD special order number 40. Immediate action is required because SB 1767 will be heard in the State Senate's Public Safety Committee next Tuesday morning. Council must first make finding pursuant to Government Code Section 54954.2 before considering the substantive motion. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. If anybody wishes to be heard on the findings, not, please prepare the roll on the findings and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That item is before us. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, um, I'm going to read to you from SB 1767 proposed by a state senator from Temecula. Uh, and I want to thank Mr. Karsh from the CLA's office for bringing it to our attention this morning and making sure that we act on it today. This is, this is the language that, that the senator is going to propose to the state senate next week. If, exactly. If, and I'll just read the relevant parts. If a city has adopted an order that prohibits its officers and employees from cooperating in their official capacities with federal immigration officials in any investigation, detention, or any other way, uh, the controller shall not allocate funds or any form of state aid or assistance to such agency. In other words, this is a state senator who is proposing to cut off state funding to the LAPD because of the LAPD's adoption of Special Order 40. And as all of you know, um, that order has been amended slightly in the past, and it always comes up for discussion, and it's a controversial matter. I happen to believe it's a sound matter of public policy. There are probably those in Los Angeles who disagree with it, but uh, wherever you land on it, to propose cutting off funding for the LAPD as a result of this public policy uh, is it's it's asinine. I mean, there is there is a spectrum uh, between irresponsible and stupid, and somewhere on that spectrum, this bill does lie. Uh, I think we need to make sure that our voices are heard before this bill is heard next week in Sacramento, and would encourage your support for this motion, which puts the city on record opposing the bill. Thank you, Mr. Karsh. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. And we do appreciate catching that, Mr. Karsh. Anybody else wishing to be heard on this? Mr. Reyes. I know we're on a short fuse here, but I just want to thank my colleague for bringing this together, putting a focus on this type of policy that is just so irresponsible, puts so much weight on our municipal funds. So thank you so much. Thank you. Let's prepare the roll on the item and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. We'll send that forthwith. All right, uh, any housekeeping? Yes, council has motions for posting and referral. They are posted and referred. There are excuses on the desk. Council Member LeBonge requests to be excused Tuesday, April 4th for personal business that meets council policy. Mr. LeBonge is excused. And Council Member Padilla requests to be excused April 5th to leave at 11 a.m. for city business that meets council policy. Mr. Padilla is excused. And that clears the desk. Any announcements, colleagues? Announcements, Mr. Zine? I'd just like to uh, wish all of the law enforcement personnel that are going to be participating in the Baker to Vegas run uh, that uh, starts tomorrow morning. Good luck. The uh, 10,000 or so, including 4,500 runners, will be leaving in the morning from Baker, California, running all the way through to Las Vegas, where they'll uh, celebrate uh, Sunday evening. So I just want to wish all of the law enforcement personnel good luck in that race. And if you're traveling to Las Vegas through the back roads, through Pahrump and those areas, There'll be a number of law enforcement personnel on this annual 
run. It's uh, over 20 years, the 120-mile relay run from Baker, California to Las Vegas. We wish him well. Thank you. Other announcements? Ms. Padilla? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, on behalf of uh, – well, Mr. Race is still here. I <laughs> uh, wanted to uh, remind everybody of the uh, uh, annual Cesar Chavez walk tomorrow, Saturday morning, uh, that uh, starts at 9 a.m. from the kiosk uh, at Alvarez Street. This is the eighth annual uh, march to honor the, and celebrate the legacy of United Farm Worker President and Founder uh, Cesar Chavez, who uh, Robert F. Kennedy described as one of the heroic figures uh, of our time. Uh, today, March 31st, has been announced earlier, is his birthday, and we celebrate his legacy. Thank you. Other announcements, Mr. Parks? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. There are several announcements. One, the uh, young, uh, young Center for Academic and Cultural Enrichment uh, at USC, which is their uh, 2006 annual uh, California Youth Think Tank summer program, uh, is accepting applications. Uh, they have, must be postmarked by April 1st. Uh, the program starts June 27th through July 2nd, and contact numbers 310-670-8500. Also, uh, one of our uh, main cornerstones in the 8th District, Ms. Mamie Clayton, who has the largest black-owned, privately black-owned movie and book collection uh, in the world, is having a, a uh, panel discussion about the development of her library, and it's going to be at, on Thursday, August the 6th at 7.30 p.m. at the Huntington Library in San Marino. Uh, contact information is 626-794-4677. Uh, also, there's going to be a town hall meeting presented by the local FBI office and the Multicultural Advisory Committee at the Exposition Park Epic Center, 3980 South Menlo, on Saturday, uh, April the 8th, from 10.30 to 1 p.m. And then also one of our local community uh, leaders is involved in a uh, fitness challenge at the Rose Bowl on Saturday, August the 8th. And basically, uh, we'll have a number of community people, but it's, it's youth-oriented, dealing with fitness, uh, and that's uh, uh, 818-888-7091. And then finally, the LAPD recruitment car show at Lamert Park will be Sunday, uh, April the 9th, uh, basically from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Show uh, This car show opens at 7 a.m. and is presented by LAPD Southwest Division along with the Lamert Park Business Association. Thank you. Other announcements? Mr. Reyes. Yes. Just for the record, I wanted to congratulate Councilmember Huizar and his staff for organizing the march. That is tomorrow, and I want to thank Councilmember Padilla for helping with the announcement. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Mr. Padilla, you have another announcement? So that's the march uh, tomorrow here in, in downtown Eastside area. On Sunday, uh, we have our own in the San Fernando Valley, which begins uh, at 11 o'clock at Brand Park uh, in Mission Hills, and will uh, travel its uh, usual a route. This is the 13th annual out in the San Fernando Valley, ending at San Fernando Park in the city of San Fernando with a cultural arts festival. Uh, for more information, people can call 818-837-2272. Other announcements? Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, two uh, announcements tomorrow uh, for the residents of Granada Hills. There's a community cleanup uh, beginning at the fire station, fire station 18. Uh, near Norwood uh, Country Club. It will begin with a fire station. It's sponsored by myself and the fire department. We'll begin doing some work around the fire station, then move up and down Balboa, begin at 8 a.m. Fire Station 18. And then on Sunday, for those of you who enjoy the environment of Los Angeles, a very unique environment, the once a year opening of the Chatsworth Reservoir and Ecology Pond area, which is a very unique environmental sensitive area of the city of Los Angeles, the very first environmental zone in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, is opened up for those that want to celebrate Earth Day. And we begin 11 o'clock with a blessing of the Earth by Monty Wyeth, who is the uh, chief of the Chumash Indian Nation, who comes by and does a traditional blessing of the Earth. And then we open up for interpretive uh, hikes through the reservoir, which is only open once a year. So anyone interested in seeing this very unique e e environmental uh, sense of area in the city of LA, it's open to the public off of Valley Circle Drive in Chatsworth. Great. Thank you. 
Um, also, I know on Monday, our city attorney, Rocky Delgadillo, is uh, hosting the beginning of the Genocide Education Project, which is just here at the Gallery Bridge between City Hall and uh, uh, City Hall East, which uh, for uh, features portraits and oral histories of the Armenian Genocide, and we commend that to folks. And this Sunday, there's an art exhibition in Ms. Gruel's district at the Viva Gallery, uh, Marshall Turner's Watercolors, which uh, is there at 13261 Moore Park at Fulton. And uh, we know him to be a very fine artist, so recommend him as well. Uh, with that, are there any adjourning motions, colleagues? Anybody have adjourning motions? Please rise for adjourning motions. Mr. Zahn. Thank you, Mr. President. Robert Poole passed away March 25th. Los Angeles Police Officer Robert Poole, serial 25148. Passed away on Saturday, March 25th in Palmdale, California. Officer Poole was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on April 22nd, 1953. Been living in California since the age of nine. Officer Poole was appointed to the Los Angeles Police Department on October 20th, 1986, and was last assigned to the Pacific area. He will be missed by his family and friends, survived by his wife, Susie, daughters, Alexis, son, Matthew, mother, Joan, and sister, Sheila. Officer Robert Poole, Los Angeles Police, may he rest in peace. Thank you, Mr. Zion. Are there joining motions, colleagues? If not, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Again, happy birthday, Tony Cardenas, and to Janice Hahn yesterday, and everybody have a great weekend. This meeting of the Los Angeles City Council is adjourned.